Whoo! So listen, it took a lot of work to get everybody on page, on task, on mission together, get everybody's social media lined up. But back in the game, Yusef Watif, and I brought I brought some heavy hitters in tonight that are people with a lot to say because this topic is something some of us talked about privately, some publicly, and part of the seed for inspiration was Ruby uh, down there at the bottom because she was giving people problems on a message board, on a conversation that had a lot to do with this. Mm-hmm. And let's just start, let's start from the bottom row. Let's start with Ruby. Tell them who you are, what you do, um, what formal education you have in this, which is one of the main reasons I wanted to bring you in. Okay, well, obviously, I'm Classic Ruby. Uh, I started with a social commentary blog what, 11 years ago, but uh, really what I am pursuing, I go to McMaster University. I am in the psychology, neuroscience, and behavior program there, um, and my specialty is evolutionary psychology. So not just, you know, people and why do they do what they do and why do we think the way we think, but, you know, how did we evolve to be this way? Um, How was it socially adaptable? How was that part of, you know, survival of the fittest? We think about our eyes or, you know, our limbs, but the way that we think and all of these little tricks that our mind plays on us, these are actually evolutionary survival mechanisms. And I wanted to know more about those. So I basically take my education and what I've learned and what I continue to learn and I apply it to today's problems in a nutshell. Wow. Well, let's let everybody check out. This is our YouTube page. Everybody go join. We need to put some peer pressure on her to get some more videos up. Yes, please. And please join and please share because I have a couple of videos. You'll know when you see them. Um, And what YouTube likes to do is shadow ban some of my commentary. Um, So, you know, they don't actually ban it or pull it off YouTube. They just make it impossible for you to say, add it to your own video and like the pop-ups to suggest or whatever. And it won't, I can't suggest it at the end of my videos. You couldn't suggest it at the end of yours. So yeah, you know. Ruby, you guys, woo, we, no, I can't be showing that on my channel. What you got on yours? It it was on you. Trying to get me kicked off YouTube? There, it's not oh. showing any nipple. That's all I'm going to say. It was it was on Facebook. The woman shared it on Facebook. That was the whole point. I thought I was edgy. <laughs> <laughs> Topaz, say hello. Tell them who you are, what you do. Okay. Um, well, online. Huh, okay. Well, my YouTube page is called Topaz Presents. And so I initially had a YouTube page where it was just me on here watching and interacting with people. But one thing that I noticed is that in a lot of the conversations, I felt like there were certain things that weren't being said. And it was slightly different than other people. And that's how I got the name of my YouTube channel. Um, one person, just me, my viewpoints, my experiences, things I've gone through, and how I get sometimes a slightly different take on the same instance that everybody is discussing at that moment. So I consider myself um, to be what I want black people to go to be going forward. And I think that we would be more at peace. We would be able to help one another and we finally have a culture that we can be proud of. So that's what it is I do on my YouTube channel. Um, My living, I'm a licensed counselor and intern uh, supervisor. So I teach other uh, up and coming counselors in mental health and substance abuse disorders. And I, the thing I have in common with Ruby is that I believe we look at the past and we learn from what the past taught us. We think about how it applies to currently and then we project what we we get to decide what to project into the future. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to bring together with the commentary that I make. My brain is starting to hurt already. AJ. <laughs> so, um, I'm probably the least advanced out of the two ladies um, because they are on it. Um, So for me, I just, uh, I live, man. I live, I feel like I'm an example. I try to live an example of everything that the the ladies have said that they learn, um, that stuff that I have uh, just really tried to model and be, right? So, so from I studied I studied neuroscience, epigenetics, quantum physics, and just learning how the mind works and um, showing people how to make that a reality. Um, I feel like everybody should have 100% control of their time. 
Uh, I don't feel like anybody should have control of anyone's time. Um, so I just work with people to help them get free and show them that, you know, it's, it's not only a possibility, but it's a true reality. And if so you control your book. time, you control your life. Oh, so that's a that's my uh, that's my first book, uh, Day Grades, and it's just journeys how I went from sleeping in my car uh, to giving away six cars. Uh, I think it was five at the time I wrote it, it's six now. Uh, and in a very short period, I think it was four years, and now I live in Medellin, Colombia, or wherever I want to live. And I feel like everybody should have that option. Like nobody should tell us what to do with our time. Wow. So, I just try to, I try to embody that. Well, before we get down to business, I always want to say thank you and hello to people like um, Raining Woman, who is always just all-star cheerleader. She has an amazing page, and I hope everybody gets a chance to it. And I, I think the people here uh, already have, but I hope everybody gets a chance to go by her page. Her page is very different from mine, but it's it's something that. You might not know. Uh, you might not know what you need until you find it and find out. That's what. Look at that. That's beautiful. Raining woman. Oh, I like it. And I hope everybody goes through and, and checks that out. Hello, Damon. Thanks for popping in. Let me back up for a second. Damon, I don't know if have you been in with us before. Uh, either way, make sure you uh, click subscribe and please everybody share this. We like to get a lot of very interesting and diverse thought. Uh, Unc, always, always all-star. Nathan Francis, all-star. Uh, you know where I get this from? When I was a kid, there was a, a children's program where the lady would always hold up her magic mirror. And do you remember this? And she would say, I see AJ and I see Ruby and I see Topath. And she would never say, I see Watif. Wow. <laughs> now, when, you're, when, you're, when you're seven, you don't realize she's just reading from a script of the 20 most common names, but when your name right. is Yusuf Watif, you don't get your name called. Right. Mm -hmm. Hello, Kenny. And so I make it a point, you know, whenever I have anything like this going, I like to say everybody's name. I guess I'm making up for what I missed in my youth. <laughs> well, my Hilarious. name outside of YouTube is not, well, I mean, it's common, but it's not the top 20. So I would have, some days I hear my name and some days I don't. And so then it's even worse. <laughs> yeah, well, for me, I pretty much uh, got used to that that hard reality that nobody's calling my name back because I got to make people know who I am. Right. That's what I set out to do. So w when we talk about something, well, first of all, when I started to really look up Evo Psych, evolutionary psychology, there is a whole lot of kerfuffle as to whether or not it even exists, as to whether or not it's even a legitimate branch of study, because I believe that either all psychology is legitimate or none of it is because it's all built on theories and theories that change less than once a generation. Is that a reasonable statement? No. See, oh, here we go. psychology um, is a science. Sure, you want to call it a soft science, whatever. The point is, is that it has to stay consistent with all of the other sciences. Um, and so any theory that's created, right, anything that is upheld, it's not going to be um, changing to the point where, oh, it's just it was crazy. It was out in left field because it has to be consistent with the other disciplines and the other sciences. Right. So what happens is with our study of something you can't see. Right. Um, just like I mean, you have the theory of gravity. Right. We can see the effects of gravity, but we can't physically see gravity. So all we can do is theorize things about gravity and we can just keep trying to repeat it and say, OK, well, no, well, it's a law. It's a theory. And theory doesn't mean something all fluffy like it does uh, colloquially. Right. When we're talking about the sciences. But it's because it's something we cannot see. We can't touch it. Well, well, so well, the well, mind I'm is not, something you I'm can't see. I am a layman, but I would push back on you using gravity as an example because gravity is a consistent regardless of what culture you're in, what country you're in. Mm -hmm. Whereas the majority and stunning and overwhelming majority of uh, psychological theories are not. They're only consistent in the culture in which they were conceived. Well, psychology, see, that's the thing. I'm talking about the mind. The mind has always existed. Uh, we didn't actually, I mean, you have times where people weren't really sure that the mind existed. Maybe it's just behavior that exists. There's no internal dialogue or internal functioning of the mind that is making this happen. Since we can only see behavior, let's only study behavior, right? So what I'm saying when I'm comparing uh, 
something to gravity. I'm comparing the mind to gravity, right? It's something we can't touch. It's something we can't feel. So what so we're- So evolutionary psychology is something we can touch and feel? Well, no, and that's it's because it's a study about something we can't touch and feel. So what we're doing then is we are taking, say, behaviors um, that we see or developments in your biology throughout um, your growth process, right? And we are saying, hey, okay, listen, based on that, this would make sense. Let's now go and repeat that in today's world and see if it holds up, see if it's true. Um, and so we keep trying to repeat studies and the more we can repeat something, right, and get the exact same result over and over, the more we can say, okay, I think this theory makes sense, right? But at first, like with any theory, the only theories we hear about scientifically, the only things that you or the average layman know about scientifically are the things that held up to rigorous testing over and over and over again. But there's a, a lot of things that people theorize or hypothesize um, and then it didn't hold up, right? Does that mean that, you know, biology yeah, or, here, you know, physics isn't a real thing? Before we go on to Topaz, this is what I want to say is that nothing holds up, in my opinion, in soft sciences, nothing holds up consistently over time. That's why when we start to play what I call mind games, don't get me wrong, I subscribe to certain things that are true, but I believe those truths may be consistent with where I am, where I am in time, and where I am geographically. So that's when I talk about evil psych and the underpinnings of different things like attraction, mate selection, what makes us want someone, what makes us not want someone. That's where I would go to. Topaz, did you get a chance to look at any of the stuff that we, we passed around earlier in any of the reading? Um, no, but I did. I have um, been able to study um and find out things about evo site but specifically what um what the concerns are here today i know what the topic is and what we were here to discuss but i didn't get reading from you guys but i had been reading in the past on my own gotcha because we, we talked about well aj you just read it fill them in oh uh, i didn't read it enough to fill them in because i was working on all the other stuff oh um, right we have those technical difficulties because yeah you know, Talk about, okay, I have a friend, my group of friends, and all of you are in different groups of friends that I have, but one of the things that we all have in common is we pretend to be smarter than we are sometimes. And having said that, when we read about evolutionary science, well, I'm telling the truth, Popaz, we pretend to be smart. We know we're probably not, but it's fun sometimes. But well, you're not uh, the only one is what I meant. Like, like we pretty much, we all do that at times. Um, we read about evolutionary psychology in the way that a lot of men are through evolutionary psychology is in the context of what motivates women's behavior to, for, around, and about men. And one of the things that, uh, and, and I wish you could, could be here, uh, Phyllis Serene, she's on my Facebook, I share a lot of her stuff. She's writing a book on manhood. And one of the things that she cited was an article about five traits of masculinity. And it spoke truthfully about a couple of different things that high testosterone is responsible for, but it didn't really get into the underpinnings of why men seek to be high testosterone men and replicate certain behaviors. For example, one of the things she said was it makes men, that men are aggressive. But while that may be true, she never talked about men are aggressive because we tend to, and, and AJ, feel free to disagree if you disagree with me on this, men tend to replicate the behaviors that women reward with time and attention. And we've learned that masculinity, aggression, high testosterone behavior consistently rewards us in that, in that fashion. So when they talk about things like uh, it makes men more prone towards violence, but it also doesn't say that when anyone in society looks for protection, they look from the men who are capable of doing it. Maybe not recklessly, it's the difference between being a trained fighter and some street thug, both of whom may be capable of you know, defending themselves or someone they care about. Right. Well, I actually agree with you. And this is the thing, um, there's a lot of debate. Once you get to a place where you, um, you know, like have degrees and have experience and studies and everything, what's the next mm -hmm. thing that happens? Everybody then divides up between which degree is better than which. So the hard and soft sciences have to work together just specifically for the reason that you said. The soft sciences are the ones that we are talking about things you still have free will and a choice in the matter. The hard ones are the ones where there is no leeway, no gray, no gray area. So in what you just said, I definitely agree because scientifically we can prove that men have high, higher levels of the hormone testosterone and we can prove what it is responsible for in the body. But how you use that testosterone and what it does in your body 
um, whether you use it to pummel somebody that looks at you too long in a way that you don't like versus whether you use it to build a house from scratch, you know, with just the material is the difference. And that is because of what you just said, the soft part. Why do women reward certain behaviors? What do we think certain behaviors are responsible for and what they look like is essentially the whole entirety of the soft science with this psychology. You know what? It, this might be a little tardy to the party, but have you ever played the game Two Truths and a Lie? Yes. Okay. I'm going to play a game with my friend Suzette here, and I'm going to tell everybody three things and you need to decide which two things about her are true, uh, which two things are true, and which one is a lie. One, she is a fucking unicorn. I knew you were going to pick that. <laughs> two, her name is Suzette. Or three, She's really not an alcoholic, even though she keeps drinking one <laughs> off the side of the screen. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice. yes, nice. with an introduction like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Suzette and I, the last time we talked, we were talking about how abortion controls people, weren't we? Yes, yeah, the influence of abortion on social control. Yes, yes, well, we were. Well, tell them who you are and kind of what you've got behind your name, because I, I personally like to be the least educated person when I have a group trend chat. That way I know I learned something. Suzette, tell them who you are and what makes you so smart. So um, what makes me smart is I drink and I read. Like, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. nice. That's kind of how I do. Um, no, so my background, I was originally a, a therapist. I'm a master's cl trained clinician um, and went from being a provider working in a variety of clinical settings and populations into healthcare administration. And so now I um, have a dual role. One, I help organizations oversee their risk and quality and, and healthcare operations, both as a consultant and as a, a full-time member of the executive team. And I also run my own business, which is a uh, sex positive brand um, that is geared towards encouraging exploration and um, experiences of black people within the kink sphere called Affimidis. So those are the my two hats that uh, I wear and, and I would like to say I wear them well, hence why I drink and read. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and so that's what that's what kind of brought me over to, to this conversation. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, with, with that kind of accreditation, it, it's, it's a good thing I'm, you're on my team. Where you make a good addition to a zombie apocalypse team, I will say that. <laughs> yeah. You could talk them down, calm them down. Listen. What makes you so angry? Did you not get the right health care you needed? Like, this our brain's really before? giving you what you need, really. <laughs> <laughs> right, so y'all have thought this through. Well, uh, you would think so, right? <laughs> so here, here's where we are. Here, here's where we are. Yeah. When we were talking about earlier with that whole issue of the article and evolutionary psychology, what I wanted to really get to it, and this is something AJ may also as, as another man here, one of the things that we keep coming up against is that I feel, and, and, and I feel free to agree to, or disagree, Adrian, I want your opinion on this next. When you start to learn about evolutionary psychology, specifically in the context of man-woman relationships, one of the, the hard things that men learn, and it's harder the younger you are, is that there is a direct correlation between, well, or should I say an inverse correlation, between how aggressively you treat women and how high they hold you in a relationship regard. Okay. Hmm. I would disagree. Yeah. Okay. I would disagree. Um, from the women that I've dealt with, for me, it's not, I think, I think the, I think surface level, it seems like that, but if you dive into their past, then it depends on how they want to be treated. You know, how did they dad treat them? How did they get attention from men when they were younger? So if, if, you have to put all of that into play. You just can't, you know what I'm saying? You just can't blanket it like, oh, if you treat women this way, they give you attention. No, nah, because if her dad treated her nicely, then she's going to be looking for a dude to treat her nicely. You know what I'm saying? If her, if if she got, it, it all depends on the woman. I I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, to say it. It was that cut and dry from mm. my dating experiences. Mm. Ruby, don't choke. 
I know, right? I was a little worried. <laughs> You're a little far for me to do CPR, bro. <laughs> you know, I read that with CPR, we were that they're teaching it backwards now. Before yeah, it used to they be, just, they just removed the, um, they removed one element. So there used to be mouth to mouth resuscitation as well as chest compressions. And it turns out that mm -hmm. mouth to mouth is just not as efficient as chest compressions are. So now the focus is on teaching people how to do that correctly. Um, and, and that improves survival rates. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm still waiting for an excuse to use my Heimlich maneuver, but Abdominal thrusts, they're no longer called the Heimlich maneuver. Ah, the Heimlich <laughs> ah, Yes, the, the family one there, 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 uh, case. So they are now called abdominal thrusts. So while you've got the microphone, give me your thoughts sure. on what Adrian has said. I think Adrian is spot on. Um, I think that evolutionary psych can give a um, understanding of how some uh, institutional and social structures evolved in our, our society. However, um, the attempt to distill it all the way down to individual uh, behaviors and individual relationships, that's when it starts to get a lot weaker. Um, I think that conditional um, conditional upbringing, as he said, is a much more accurate reflection of how any one woman or any one man would respond to the levels of aggression in their relationship. If you're talking about a young lady who grows up in a home, like, I'll, and I'll use myself as an example to keep it personal. My father is definitely a manly man. He is definitely very comfortable in his role as a man. My, I have I have heard my father raise his voice on maybe two occasions in my life. He is a man of very few words, um, and but yet I've never felt unprotected in his presence. I have never felt um, like my femininity was deferred in any way. He's never based his masculinity on my role as a woman or my mother's role in relation to him. His masculinity was a self-contained um, experience. And so what that did was in growing up watching that, I never attached uh, masculinity to aggression or, you know, I, it was, he, he definitely could handle himself, but he did not seek out arguments, um, discussions and arguments that happened between my mom were, were discussions of words. There was never a time when he ever seemed out of control or seemed um, a slave to his biology. And so because of that, that is what I expect of men that I see, regardless of how big you are, small you are, my concept of masculinity was one of discipline and control. Um, and so, yeah, so any man who decided to spring up at me and to start barking, <laughs> like, was going to run into a problem, not because of evolution, but because my concept of masculinity was not shaped in that window. And so I think that that is what you see for a lot of women. You know, unfortunately, a lot of women have experiences with men that are coercive or are tinged with violence or have had these interactions with men where where they grow up in environments where they see a lot of explicit um, explicit violence. And so their concept of what makes them feel safe, what makes them feel protected, what makes them feel secured will end up being shaped by what they have seen or experienced as a strong man, however that may play out in the dynamics that they see. And so I think that for, that's where I feel like a lot of men struggle because, you know, they, we don't have a lot of the markers that I think at different points in our development as human society that we once had that allowed men to have these clearly defined ways of knowing, yes, this is how I know I am a man, whether it was a naming ceremony, whether it was a, a, um, a marker of puberty, whether it, whatever those ceremonies were, whatever those experiences around other men, um, they, they, we don't have those clear markers anymore. And so all they can do is kind of piecemeal together from what they see from popular culture, what they experience, what they, what they experience and where they're raised and where they're grown. And I think that has a much stronger influence on how they conceive of masculinity and aggression than any evolutionary site can explain. Hmm. When you talked about, well, no, I, I suppose I understand when you talk about cultural markers, um, it's those things that separate boyhood from manhood mm -hmm. legally and in the sight of 
the community, whatever that community is. Hmm. So, so I'm gonna tell you something. When I was a barber, um, I was cutting hair, and and I had a, a primarily black barber shop, but I used to cut white guys' hair. And I had a white guy come in the shop, and we were talking about just life. And he said, "You know, the biggest advantage white men have over black men." So of course the barber shop like got quiet. Like, what the? You know what I'm saying? Like, and he said the biggest advantage is not always, but he did he did say not always, but he said typically we have our fathers and our grandfathers to help us through the transitions of manhood and you don't so if you don't have a father if you don't have a grandfather you don't have someone to help you through the transitions of manhood and if i'm not going through the transitions of manhood um i'm 27 like i was 27 and i was still wondering am i a man mm. you know what i'm saying i've been paying my own bills i own the bar i don't i don't my own business for almost four years and i was still questioning my man because i didn't have mm -hmm. kids Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have a wife. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? All the all the markers, like the markers that you talk about. Yeah, I didn't Absolutely. have those, right? So then it becomes, well, F it. I'm gonna just get a lot of chicks because that's gonna make me feel like a man, right? <laughs> but then when you're done getting a lot of chicks, you still like, well, damn, am I a man? You know what I'm saying? Like, so if if that to me that when when we talk about manhood and and what women are looking for, I mean most men from especially as a barber what i've seen is most men are perpetrators like we we're frauds we're gonna do whatever it takes to get what we want so we're chameleons we'll switch into whatever role it takes to get the prize and it's not until you become comfortable with who you are and just be like yo like i mean it, you know i ain't trying to sound cocky but he'd be like i'm the thing you know what i'm saying like i am the prize so I ain't gotta, I ain't gotta do nothing for nobody. And the pro, you know what I'm saying? Like whoever get me is the, that's the winner. Yeah. Until you come to that, until you come to that mindset, then, yo, we we keep we keep being a fraud. We keep being whatever it takes to get what we want. And to me, that's the evolution. Because to me, I think that's the evolution of it. Because as we think things change, we change to get what we want. So if it's playing football, we play football. If it's wearing baggy clothes, we wear baggy clothes. If it's wearing skinny jeans, we wear skinny jeans. But we only doing that because we want the prize. Not realizing, bro, you are the prize. That seems like, like I would, really, let's go past for a second. Go ahead. Sorry, Topaz, were you about to say something? Oh, no, well, <clears throat> mentioning what AJ was just discussing is that seems to be going around lately men saying that they are the prize there's a big huge debate in uh well first of all YouTube but even on any social media platform is who is the prize the man or the woman and so what you talked about when you mentioned the guy telling you that other races have their have their dads to usher them into manhood and you guys don't the that's the thing that's missing is the welcoming for the other men who have achieved it first to say, yes, I had to go through that and now you have crossed that boundary. You did right, you know, you got the answer right. So a lot of men who do have a lot of different relationships with women and they are high and cold towards these women and can't get enough, they're looking for that validation, but they know inherently it's not gonna come from a woman because she can tell you one second when you're doing what she wants, she can say, oh you're the best man ever and then the minute you disappoint her she can say oh you're nothing and it will have an extreme impact on you because you weren't welcomed already to know that the second sentence is not accurate and so you look for those markers and then those markers are held from you and so it's kind of a it, it's something that works together in a, in a huge system together to make sure that you never achieve manhood that you stay as a boy there are other races of 27 year old men who have done you you've been an author you um you know created businesses but for some reason you were still questioning that and there were a lot of different women and no kids because that's what you felt manhood would be so what i normally tell men in that predicament when when if i ever get men clients to come in my office with that situation what i normally tell them is well then now you have to define it for yourself what do you see in the, the people that you consider to be what manhood is and then you get those markers. It can be, because that's what it would be anyway. Your grandparents, your grandfather and your father would be telling you what they think a man is. And then you would be living up to that standard. So you can just make that standard now. And if you feel like it needs to have a wife and kids available, then you go out and get those. And then if you feel like 
you being, um, you know, writing books to help others in your community and, and building businesses that help others, that that's manhood as well, then you get to determine that. So it's something that we don't get that welcoming ceremony early enough. Then then during our early adulthood, we make a lot of mistakes that later on when we, make, when we finally come up with our decision, now those mistakes are still there. And now you even tell yourself, I wasn't a man at one step. I've heard men say that. So how all this relates to you saying that you're surprised is what I'm saying is that you finally come into that where you are now determining that for your own your own um, definition, you've met manhood. And it took you until this age, but not at 27. And right. so that's what I think everybody's doing now with this argument. That's why I haven't gotten involved with the argument on who's actually the prize, the men or the women. Because for me, see, it sounds like they're trying to make sure that they feel like me. But but to me, the thing with being a prize is, I think we're both the prize. I can only attract the prize if I am a prize. And that's my point too, which is why I don't break me and say it because you are. It's just when you finish the sentence, when you go through whatever journey you're going through, at the end of that sentence, my hope is that you'll say, and we both are. Of course. That, I mean, that's what I, that's Not what you should look for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. But we, we should all look for the prize, right? right. For, so, right. and, and, and so when I see <laughs> when I see relationships that don't work, typically it's because one person felt they did get a prize and the other person didn't. One person right. married because they got the prize, the other person married because it was convenient. Yeah. Right? right. So but then when the not, prize was on the horizon and the marriage was set to that prize. So yeah. they weren't doing it. Because there, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of people who confuse marriage with being the prize as opposed to the partner or their actual relationship. Right. That's a whole right. other. Mm -hmm. They want the status. Right. Let me uh, let me do this real quick. Art of becoming more. Wrote that she said, in my culture, prior to the war, there was a specific process men and women went through to be seen as men and women. However, now it's more fractured, uh, unfortunately. Art, I, I do want you to tell us specifically what culture you're talking about. And I wanted to, before Ruby had her uh, chance at the microphone, when AJ said, I am the prize, I can understand that because one of the things that I was taught, a lot of the things that made me a successful man, um, I find, people find controversial when the, the younger men who begin to come to me for mentorship, when I teach them the same thing, because I was taught the same thing. I said, you know, and, and there are some harsh realities between the way men are judged and the way women are judged. And I was taught that women, or rather access to women as a man, is the result of correct decisions and correct living. And I had a woman come to me and say, well, you know, you because I have a website, I've written things. She said, you know, when you say that, you make it sound as if women are a prize. And I said, well, I think having your choice of women is the prize if you've done other things correctly. Men that are not necessarily rich, but financially stable. Men that don't have to be bodybuilders or athletes, but are physically competent. Men that don't necessarily own their own business for whatever that means, I'm not business shaming, but are in complete control of their own professional future. Well, as a direct consequence, access to women will happen for you. But I've actually had pushback saying, well, that is a diminutive towards women. And I think that what we miss is, this is kind of like the article, and I'm gonna read some points from the article later, but this is what drives men to be better men. Um, and oh, wait, wait, here we got the Lorma, tri the Lorma tribe in Liberia. I got to read more about that. Right. Got to read more about that. Maybe, you know, Liberia is an interesting, you know what? We You have to come and say hello and talk to us about Liberia. It's an interesting place. Yeah, I would definitely like to learn more about I, yeah, it. Me I'll three. Be, I yeah. love that. <laughs> But um, I think that I well, think. Hold on, hold on one second. I want to let you be. Um, oh yes, that smoking her wizard pipe. <laughs> oh, <laughs> don't pay him no mind. Listen, we all have our vices. <laughs> Ray, I'm saying, okay, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Lisa won't give me cancer. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is this is an interesting place where we can make a distinction between say other forms of psychology and evolutionary psychology right because as we know with humans we have nature versus nurture right evolutionary psychology talks about the nature aspects um right and one of the things that we have within our nature that we are born biologically to do there are aspects of us that are blank slates that are sponges that are there to learn the culture and the society and the families that we are in so that way we can best function given whatever society we are born into 
right? This is a, a great function for human survival because, you know, if, if you were just going to be exactly the way your parents, um, you could only survive however they survived. And then, you know, in the time that you were born, things radically changed. You wouldn't be able to pick things up, right? So in that way, when we look at it, for example, women like masculine men. This is true, right? We like masculinity from men. We do not like to see men with feminine traits, feminine behavior, something that radiates femininity towards us. We're not attracted to it. Um, and it also doesn't make us feel safe and secure. Likewise, when we're talking about fighting and aggression, there is a connection there, but the connection is not about men being aggressive towards women or, or being, and this is just generally, right? Unless you have a dysfunctional nurturing in your life, you're not gonna want that uh, masculinity uh, to turn violent against you. But what you do like to see, and you see men, and this is across species, it's not just ours, they will fight more often in the presence of a woman. Why? Right? Now, this is the interesting part. This is not them fighting women. They will fight more often in the presence of a woman, though. And this is where evolutionary psychology tries to really? figure out across species why really? this happens. Normally, I would never interrupt any a guest while they were talking, but I got to give you a quick story that illustrates your point. It's interesting okay. that you said that. Um, I train in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm a struggling blue belt. Um, <laughs> it's one of the things that I love because physically it's demanding. One of my coaches, the notorious and legendary Mark Lehman, was talking about one day how on Saturdays and some evenings at the end of practice, a lot of wives and girlfriends will come to the gym to pick up their husbands and boyfriends because we're beat to shit. It's just, please drive me home, I need a shower. But he said something he noticed on Saturdays when women would come and just kind of sit on the edge and watch the guys practice. He said he learned very early as a coach that in the presence of even one woman spectator, someone was bound to get hurt. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, when there is a woman around, it doesn't matter if it's your woman or your girlfriend or your wife, it triggers something in men that doesn't make us hate each other, but every man becomes slightly more aggressive. And when you're training in something that's physical like jujitsu, you know, we tend to be a bit more vicious than if we were mm -hmm. only in the presence of men. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Yeah, suddenly. Even if it's just one woman, you're still on a on a stage, and there's the possibility for being chosen. Even if you're married, she might you. It's still you know like a compliment for her to to think that she. I mean, for the man to think that she's pining away somewhere, you know, wishing that she was the wife. So it's you. You're now on a stage. Now it's time to show whether or not you can or cannot overpower this guy that you're fighting, if the situation needs. Hmm. It's all about, and see, this is the thing. You have sexual selection, right? And then you also have survival, right? right. So uh, survival traits don't necessarily um, equate to your sexual selection traits. But this is one that does. Because a man who can fight off other men, who that's going to be really the strongest kind of human you're going to get against you, right, is other men. So a man who can protect you from other men, a man who can rise to the top of the hierarchy because no one else can beat him. So that means he can keep rising higher and higher and higher. That man is going to be able to assure you not just safety and security, but he's going to be able to assure you a good place within the tribe, right, higher and higher and higher up. Right. So this is where when we're looking at evolutionary psychology and, hey, why do we favor things? Right. Why are we kind of programmed into favor things? That would be sort of where evolutionary psychology uh, would tell us um, we're going with this. And that's why it is. It's because it's competition. It's about make competition. I want to be selected. I want to show that I am at the top of this, you know, this totem pole. I want to show that I'm the strongest, that I can hold my own. And especially, especially if your mate's there, though, the last thing you want to oh, yeah. see, you want your wife to see or your girlfriend to see is that everyone here can whoop your ass. That's the last thing you want. You will hurt yourself trying to make sure you can prove to her that you can beat the guy in front of you. So that way she can go, oh my God, baby, you're so strong. Oh my God, I can't believe you did that, right? Because when you see it, it doesn't matter. I mean, as long as it's organized and stuff, right? But you gotta admit, ladies, when you see that, I don't know if you've ever dated someone who is a fighter, right? And when you see a whoop someone's ass, you go, oh. I can't believe you did that. He was so I'm big. Saying, I I was worried, the old lottery, lottery, right? You know, the thing that I was worried about is now gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what's interesting about that, though, 
is that like I like that you that you spoke to the difference between mate selection and status and survival because I think that sometimes that has been a weakness of of early evolutionary psych where it was very hetero heteronormative and it was very much based on male and female and some of these some of these subtle dif um, differentiations and nuances got lost because it is about status. It is about um, in in fields of competition for men, it is a pecking order. It's about how do I place myself in the ranking of other men, regardless of whoever it is that so whether even and you see this even amongst gay men like the idea that gay men are not competitive or not aggressive. I mean, I'm like, listen, you have not been in the circles I've been at if that's mm -hmm. what you believe. And part of that is because in these environments, it is about am I where am I on the roster? Where am I am I on this selection piece? Am I the winner or the loser? Am I a part of the winning team or not? Collaboration and co and competition are primary drivers of establishing status, especially with if you don't have any other social markers that could alleviate that initial primal evaluation. And so yeah, it is about it's definitely about that survival. It's about winning. It's about coming up on the top of the heap and i think that we do ourselves a disservice to pretend that there is not something very reinforcing for a lot of men about that mm -hmm. there is something that that feeds a part of their soul when they are winning or when they can win or if they are going to lose that they lose against an opponent that that they cannot win against right. if that makes sense mm -hmm. right Ruby, do you see the question you have there Okay, hold on. how does uh, same-sex attraction factor into this? Okay, in all fairness, I'm not going to say that I've studied how it would factor in, but what I will say is that it would factor in exactly the same, um, right? You think about as a man, regardless of whether or not your woman walks in to watch you, your man walks in to watch you, right? You want to prove to him that you're strong. You want to prove to him, even if you are, as we would say, the woman in the relationship or whatever, you're the more feminine one, you still want to prove that you can hold your own as a man, right? I do not know a single solitary man. I don't care how much of an artist he is, how soft people think he is, or how gay he was or whatever, who wants to be looked at as weak and pathetic. I don't know one, right? Men are like that. It's an internal biological drive that men know that they're supposed to and that they want to be able to protect and defend. So it's going to, I, I would assume that it would be very similar if they did same sex studies. I'm not sure if they have, they might have. I just haven't they, read they it. Actually, they actually have in a lot, they have not been in the last like 10, 15 years. They actually right. has been quite a bit of focus in evolutionary psych on that. And I think, and that's where I got my understanding that it is about who, regardless of who your mate is, regardless of whether it's male, female, whatever, it's about in the about status and in how you are being perceived. And even if it's an artist, Mm -hmm. Guess what? If it's an artist, that artist wants to know that he has the best art piece ever. <laughs> like, right. it and, before, and before anybody clicks off, that's make sure that's where you click her uh, website there. Yeah. Go like that on Facebook. Yes. Uh, Suzette, so, Suzette said, "Give me bondage." So make sure you go like her page. Absolutely. Uh, but that's so to to um the to the point at hand. You know, it is it is about can i win and and across species whether it's can you is your plumage the biggest and brightest is your can you build the best nest can you paint the big pick the prettiest rock whatever it is <laughs> Man, if you think about something. it even like being like the way i've the way i've dated what i've seen you hear so many women say you know they'll say things like what do you call a man under six foot a friend right and it's like, what? like wow. I've heard that from so Damn. many women. Like, wow. let me call a man under six foot, a friend. And it's like, well, why would you think that? And when I've talked to them, it's because they want their children to be tall, because mm. taller people get advantages, right? As a man is as a man is looking for a mate, I want my mate to be attractive because it's been scientifically proven that attractive people get better opportunities in the workforce and life. So you're looking like hell. I. The last time I was on here, I said, yo, I want a track star that was a track star in college or a basketball player because I want to breed an athlete. Mm -hmm. Hands down, right? Now, you know is that going to happen? I don't you know. You have but... that for a reason. 
You know, there's yep. AJ. I've always seen my father and my uncle were like six two, six three, but my other uncle was the same height I am. Nobody believes me when I tell them I'm only five foot six. But because of years of weightlifting and powerlifting, I realized tall, hey, if it wasn't in the cards for me, it wasn't in the cards. But here's something that's curious about how it plays in the evolutionary psychology. Well, I actually wrote an article about this. I called it Picking Up Women. One of the things that I started doing even in high school is like, say a girl goes to give me a hug, I'll duck down and just pick her up in the air and throw her and catch her. I mean, I'm 230 pounds when I'm a bodybuilder, weightlifter. I can throw a woman up and catch her. But mm -hmm. they would scream and then they'd be like, I will tell you at a fair. Mm -hmm. Listen, when a man can pick you up and put on one piece of wine, listen. Uh, yes. <laughs> but, but look, but you know this what, is though? the thing. Can I, can I add thing. one thing to that? Just really Go quickly. Because what I know is that I want to ask you this, Yusuf. Now, because I was talking to a couple guys about this. And what they said, because they're shorter guys, is that they love tall women. They love, they want their woman, like if they had a six foot five woman, like they don't care. They love tall women. And I asked, uh, I asked a couple guys recently, why? Like, why do you love tall women? Like, why would you want a woman who's that much taller than you? And what he said was it's because he wants his children to be tall. He wants them to have the height advantage, actually. So he would rather have a woman who has that and hopefully that'll get passed down to their children. So I want to know if that has ever been a factor for you. Did well, you ever like tall, tall, that, taller, taller wanna, than you women? Listen, tall, short, crazy. Um, Men love crazy all women. Kinds of different colors. And I, I, will tell you, I will tell you my weakness. It doesn't matter what race or country or language or how tall or how short. I have always been a... And this is something my mother used to get on my case about, about uh, you know, about how I was, it, how would I put it? I'm trying to think, of how do I phrase this without it being vulgar? You I like clean it later. I don't want to be, you know, no kicked off. Um, I have always preferred women with disproportionately large hips and breasts. Like really disproportionately. So you, know, you, you know the golden ratio, right? The hip to waist right. ratio? Ah. Uh, the, it, the the golden ratio to me is basically the the female equivalent to the height. I, yeah. um, having having a, a certain percentage of your hip and waist measurements to to your hip measurements to your waist, like that has been from Venus to Milo on down. Like that is because your kids won't die in a birth canal, huh? But it, it, it has an evolutionary basis as well. Yes. As well, that. absolutely. Yep. When we talk yep. about We're surviving childbirth, needs of birth, exactly, and you will survive the rape. all of those things, all of those yep. things. Yep. Have so, to, you know. So, so, I want to so there's just, no, I will tell you before we go to AJ, here's the thing I will tell you too, is what I also learned is I have a picture on my Instagram of me on a treadmill. That picture got me more private messages than anything else. It's me in a hoodie, sweating like an animal, up to here just on the treadmill. And you know all of those messages said the same thing. And this made my skull explode. Don't get too small. I like to what you are. Blah, 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 blah. Because I didn't realize how much of my identity was. Because at 42, I'll be 43 next year. My goal is to get, to get leaner. You know, it's cool to be 230 pounds when you're... 45, 25. At 45, I don't I don't want to carry that. So what we can see visually with the height. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because if if everybody on on your page thought, was all they knew was, oh, he's five, six and smart. Okay. But then once they saw you working out, one, he's toned and he's probably strong and can still protect you. And then two, you can't be small and little because we still need to see a certain mass size. Because that will be able to protect and stop any threat as needed. Yeah. So it makes up for it visually. Whether we knew that you were, like, you could be a marshmallow and not be working out. But we see that mass size, we imagine that that's going to stop any threat. Really? You know, because it's possible. It's hard to get through that. So mm -hmm. they are not going to like you if you're smaller. Because then now you take away, you know, instead of being like this, you're kind of like this now. So now you take that away and now it's, you know. So, 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 so look at think think about this. Think about this. Have you ever noticed that most of your power lifter and bodybuilders are under six foot? 
Yeah. It's a reason. I'm six mm-hmm. three. I don't have to be a bo- I don't have to be a power lifter. True. I stand out when I walk in a place. True. Women feel protected when they walk by me or when they walk with me just because I tower over people. Mm-hmm. But all of my friends that I play football with that were under six yeah. foot, yeah, massive. And not for nothing, please understand that this dynamic plays out within women as well. Like yeah. if I had the body of a video vixen, you think I would have been reading all them damn books in high school? No, bitch. <laughs> no. Okay, you know what? Hold on. I want to come back to that. Susan. I want to come back to that because I want to. But I'm just saying, like, you develop the things right. based on what let you me, do. Let me come right back to that. I want to uh, ask AJ something. It's a real quick question, real quick answer. AJ, as a tall man, do you ever notice that short guys like me are extraordinarily vicious? Yeah, you know what? <laughs> and, and, and for no reason. I want you to know I'm here. And for no reason. Play. I call it the Tasmanian devil in the Tasmanian devil syndrome. You know what? And, and the sad part, and the sad part, part this is very mean. This is very mean. But I just feel like the air down there must be polluted or something. <laughs> hey, listen. That it make y'all right. act that way. Cause bro, we chilling. Listen. Well, they just said the song for the last week. They said you know we're not even star. Don't even. In jujitsu, they pair you by weight, mm-hmm. not height. Mm-hmm. So everybody I fight is gonna be taller than me. And I learned real early. When I grab yeah. you, I'm gonna smash your face to the ground, and I'm gonna try and rip your arm off. And I yeah. will. You know, wait. Try do, to do you know what? Do you know wait. what people that's? Do you know what men over six foot learn very quickly? We ain't gotta fight you. We just gonna walk away with your girl. Why are you fighting? You know, <laughs> Why you're fighting? You know what's interesting. I remember, like when um when I was doing my work with adolescents, what I found is that on both ends of the spectrum, the experience tends to shape the personality. So yes, for all the all the boys who were on the shorter, smaller side, listen that that vicious kind of Tasmanian devil energy it was there. For the guys who were bigger. They often learn to defer. They they became these gentle giants. They tried to they, they tried to get home because they, yeah, because a life. lot of times they were responding to people's um, initial response to them as being in you know this protector role, and they were like, oh crap, I might hurt somebody, and they became they became very conscious of their size, and that ended up shaping their personality as well. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. that happened to me definitely because in the seventh grade I was picking people up, flinging them, and. When you start, when women start saying, oh, you bruise me or, you know what I'm saying? You like, I was just playing. Then you learn to like, I don't, I don't even, I'm so gentle now right. that yeah. I, I, I remember hurting women because I didn't realize I hit a growth spurt. I didn't realize I was stronger. I'm thinking we still playing love tap and she got right. big bruises and I'm like, damn. So you, you chill out. And then mm-hmm. you become, like you said, a gentle giant and yep. a teddy bear. Yeah. And, and you all know that what stuff. all these things have in common? Because it does shape your personality. And the reason is because we, A, have free will, which means we have wants. And so if there's somebody in the environment that's stronger than me or bigger than me or could win, the winner makes the rules. So all of the competitions that we do is designed to win because at that moment you get to make the rules. And then we just have to hope that they don't get, like, power drunk or whatever. But the point is everybody, but we have free will that we use, and we use it to keep our freedom. As a taller man, you have to be the gentle giant because the scary giant gets locked up. As a shorter yeah. man, you yeah. have to be the vicious short man because a timid short man gets yeah. victimized. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it comes out that way because we all have a, the, the same thing that we're trying to do is just stay and be free and be in control of our lives, which you talk about a lot. Lisa. You're now teaching other people how to get that control over their life. Basic. Okay, yeah. So sorry to transition, guys. Nathan Francis asked, "Is the it's the symmetry concept extended or expanded?" Um, and basically, kind of, sorta, in a way. So yes, there are. Um, there is definitely. Uh, some scientific support for the idea that the more symmetrical you are, that the more pleasing to the eye that you are. Uh, when people talk about the beauty ratio, that's often what they speak about. Um, how, and however, the golden ratio, the hip to waist ratio is more closely tied to fertility than it is necessarily to beauty. Um, and so the dynamic is a little different in how it plays out. But um, so, but they are, they could be related because they are well, definitely based you know what, on that though? kind of mathematical s- spectrum. But actually, and if I could add into that. That is because we find beauty in things that will survive. We're able to rip. Well, we don't have to protect. Yeah. It. 
Exactly. And actually, there's there's a little bit more to it. And so my answer was going to be that, no, um, I mean, when we're talking about the symmetry concept, I would say it's completely different. Um, right. And the reason why. Right. Because as you mentioned, so when we're talking about the waist hip ratio and fertility and babies not dying in the womb and you not dying from trying to give birth. Um, that's one thing. Now we know we love symmetri symmetrical faces, for example, but there's a reason in it, and it actually has to do with uh, survival as far as how strong your genes are to fight off pathogens um, yep. and other types of diseases in early childhood during your development, right? Because if you are very good, your body's very good at fighting off those pathogens, at not allowing you to get very sick in early childhood, you are gonna actually develop rather symmetrically. Um, this is actually a true fact. Um, people who have more asymmetrical faces that were born symmetrical and now are slightly more asymmetrical, normally they've actually had pretty serious illnesses in childhood. So this is just, a, it's, a, it's a trick your brain um, uses to say, oh look, really symmetrical face, got strong genes, can fight off disease, all right. So that means if we have babies, our babies are gonna be more likely to survive because they're gonna be more likely to fight off viruses, bacteria, pathogens, whatever that come our way. So you know, they're, they're kind of Miss V said it's called the short man syndrome. And <laughs> I like to call it the Wolverine versus Cyclops, because mm -hmm. in comic books, you have two great, yeah. great iconic men. But some women fall in love with the Cyclops. Who's this? I was always a, Logan was always the one for me, boo. <laughs> and, and then some women fall in love with the Wolverine. Like I've had women flat out tell me that. And this is an interesting word that they use. I'm looking to. To, to your thoughts on this. I've had women tell me they do not trust men that are too good looking. They use the word trust, not attracted to. They said they don't trust men that are too good looking. I'm one they of those women. <laughs> they want the man to just be there so they don't trust that when the man says, yes, you won, that he's telling the truth because there are other options that he has. So that's you know, about the woman. That's, that's, that's not some of the, I, I know for myself, um, I think that, and, and I, I know, through my own internal work that it is very closely tied to the relationship that I have with my father, um, who yeah. is, who's always been a little, you know, he's a small Jamaican man. So he has a ruggedness to him. And it's that ruggedness, that ability to get dirty that I know that by any means necessary, he would do what was required to protect me where men who were just a little too clean cut, a little too pretty. It, it was just like, are you really going to break a nail to, to help me out? Like, it's, it, there is so there is that in that that base where you know that idea of you know how it, it's an attachment of of kind of prissiness i, I hate to use that word because it's not really accurate but there is a there's a ruggedness and a willingness to um be down and dirty that gives me comfort and i know very much i get it because of my reggaeton family <laughs> Were the women talking about um, like attractiveness, pretty, I mean, uh, attract, you know, two attractive men that were like, you know, cute or were they talking about like put together, you know? Yeah, like because that is well, different. She's absolutely yeah. right. I would be looking at it as attractiveness can be for lots of different reasons. Men can become attractive because they are handsome or powerful or respected by other men or smart or influential or feared. Whereas that symmetrical beauty is something that I think women, some women find uncomfortable. Now I may be self-selecting, right? I probably attra attract a group of women who like just grizzly men who eat with their face and throw them in the air. But you know what though, so if that's I could add, sorry, if I could just add an extra thing here, one second, I'll come back. Um, see, now my thing is, right, is I actually, I really like beautiful things. I actually like pretty faces over big muscular things. Like actually, if anything for me, I've never really liked that muscular build. I've always liked a pretty face. But what I don't like is a slick, slick behavior, slick attitude, right? Um, and, and, and to me, not only do I not trust it, but I've never found it attractive. That hot guy that everyone else found, I never found that attractive. I always found the, the quiet guy who likes to sit in the corner and read a book and you know it's a little bit mysterious and whatever like like i would have been the one who would have been dating the vampire kind of thing you know the vampire like in vibe i would have been that one right? i liked that kind of guy um and i think what it has to do for me um at least it was the idea um as far as i wanted i think 
something that as far as genetically was appealing this is this is something i've actually analyzed uh you know in school it's something i wanted that was genetically appealing that is to say you know had all the right stuff genetically but um wasn't so high up on the list wasn't a 10 so therefore they would be in the seven to eight category men who are sevens to eights they tend to actually settle down commit um you know they're more likely to want to have one wife with several children with that one That's wife awkward. and whatever because i've never seen a correlation between a man's objective handsomeness and his let me rephrase that I was taught, and here's the thing, I didn't realize how I was going to go, I might not be attractive. I was taught the behaviors that get me the women. I was taught that whether or not I'm tall shouldn't matter, whether or not I'm handsome shouldn't matter. They're the specific set of behaviors that I can exhibit as a man that will give me choice among women. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, and I will tell you that that may be the case. However, I will say that um, as, as a heterosexual woman who is selecting <laughs> a sexual option, um, the criteria in, in alignment with what Ruby is saying, the criteria was, yes, there were some men who in, if they were a certain level of attractiveness, I was like, is the, is the burden to be involved with this person worth the, mm, no. So the decisions you make as to who would make a possible partner is open to many things. Genetic fitness is one of them. Cause, mm -hmm. and, and maybe I'll speak for myself, but ladies, have you ever seen a guy? He seems okay. He seems cool, but his smell was wrong. There mm -hmm. was something about his personal aroma that just yeah. repelled you on a on a genetic level. <laughs> and there's an and there's a guy I did my very first like the love of my life guy whatever right. I'm telling you I like I thought the uh, like the smell of his sweat it smelled to me like yes. he put cologne on like yes. I would my face would be up in his armpit yes. he'd be like I didn't shower I'm like no yes. man shut up exactly. like, he smelled that good and I wasn't the only one who thought that. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something. It smelled like cologne not, for real, not, like exactly. pretty cologne. It's like real. it was weird. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's, that's that's evolution okay. because now the way our society is set up, we're allowed to pick men who can do other things. You right. know, in the past that wasn't so true. So, right. so we still respond to that. That that is still a very basic and scientific and and you know, uh, what is it? Pheromones. I, I think. Yes. It's, yeah. It's pheromones, man. So, yeah. While Ruby's on the side for evolution psychology, I'm on the side that deals mainly with na with nature. Uh, um, no, with nurture. She does the nature part. I do the nurture part. And so that's when she has comments. Usually mine are going to be about, okay, but what about what was around that that caused that? Yeah. So while that is still an enduring part of our body, we are not that far evolved from Absolutely. you know the people that we read about in history. Exactly. We're not that far Absolutely. from it. We still have a lot of things, and sometimes the uncomfortableness or the things that don't really work out so well in the puzzle that we, of our life as it is today is because it's either still stuck too far in the evolutionary part, or we're trying to uh, cognitively advance the the evolution to things that we're we don't have available right now. So mm -hmm. you know, we we like to say that we wouldn't want to deal with a guy that has too many options because it's it's going to be too much of a, a thing, but. If you if if all things were you know were controlled and you had your wish, you still would choose that person, and it's important for us to still keep that in the conversation. My perspective is a little mm -hmm. is a little different in that regard because um, I I I do feel that I am eclectic in this approach. That I do feel like we we don't really know as much as we may think we know about some right. of these biological drivers, um, and mm -hmm. so I do say that for a lot of women um, that while our sexual choices and who it is that who we pursue sexually and who we pursue for our relationship are not always this tightly bound thing. And that there are many factors that we pull some from that genetic chromosomal place, but others from that social dialogue, um, conditional, you know, upbringing kind of place. And so I think well, that's where I guess what I'm let, me, to... let me do something oh, real quick. Let right. me do things. Let, let me do things. Something real quick. One, because I know AJ. No, I know AJ needed to get in. He's been waiting for like ever. You are a patient I man. He's like, yo, let me just let the lady go. Let me just let the lady go. I want to say first. I want to say thank you to everybody who's watching. I want to say to anyone who is watching that has not hit subscribe. That's important. That's what helps us grow. If you have already subscribed. 
click the share button and share this somewhere on social media. I tell people the same thing all the time. Click it, put it on your Facebook or your LinkedIn or your Instagram or your Twitter. You know, put it someplace where people see it and say, hey, these people are having a good discussion. You know, um, put it on your Tinder profile. Say, hey, we both swiped right. So afterwards, what are we going to talk about? Let's talk about some of these things. You know, get it in however you can, because I tell people I'm not a YouTuber. Uh, I don't have a YouTube contract for anybody who does not know. Uh, I'm an editor, a writer, a copy editor. I write resumes professionally. I edit and proofread um, everything from newspapers to journals to people's university pages. Um, I, I do anything with the written or spoken English language. That's how I've made my second career after being a financial professional. I, I do even coach, I coach uh, public speaking. Adrian, have you ever coached anybody public speaking? I coach public speaking as well. These things are what I also wanna share with everybody because I wanna say this. If you've done everything else, if you share it on social media and you've already clicked subscribe, join me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, you can see my name is Yusef Watif Thorne. I don't use any pseudonyms. I come to you as I am. I'm the real person. Skip my resume. I tell everybody to go all the way to the bottom. Skip my resume. Come back and look at it later. It's fun. It's impressive. I tell people to go directly to the part where it says recommendations. Here is where you get to see what other business professionals have said about me and my ability, uh, my professionalism, what I bring to the table, why they pay me what they pay me. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of other business professionals around the world who have worked with me and endorsed me publicly. Um, and that's got to be my commercial, right? Because I'm never going to have sponsorships on my page. Hey, hey, whoa, if anybody from YouTube is listening, you want to give me a check? I'm okay with that. But I'm not going to depend on them to eat. You know, one of the things that I get to do is meet all kinds of really cool people through this channel. And I, and I appreciate everybody here for sharing this on their social media and helping me meet even more people. And, and as we, we get back in the game, I want to read... One quick thing, men are visual creatures, women may have, uh, Lillian Kiddo says, men are visual creatures, women may have a specific taste or even a fetish, but I believe we are more attracted to a man's attitude. I just answered that in the chat. I really did, because I thought we were moving on. Um, so, and what I said was this, which is true. We do care about intangible factors, right? I mean, we care about personality. We care about what your mindset. We obviously care about your leadership skills and direction. And we care about those things, but let's be real. It's not instead of it's in addition to, right? Because there are, we might meet 20 men who all have similar attitudes and belief systems and so on and so forth. And what do we go for? We go for the one we find the most attractive, um, right? And we're not just saying the most attractive in an emotional uh, way or in, you know, personality way, but also in a physical way. Out of all of those traits, we're also going to want to be protected. We're also going to want to feel safe and secure. We're also going to want to feel like, I mean, he has those masculine traits, right? We were going to want to um, have him as the head of our household, as the man in our lives, right? So we are going for short intangibles, but we definitely, definitely care about this, those tangible physical qualities and aspects as well. We can't so pretend. Remember we remember earlier when I oh. talked about big breasts and big hips? Mm-hmm. This chick on the screen, Lillian Kiddos, that's my old lady. And she, let me tell you something, she's got some knockers. <laughs> <laughs> he said he likes it disproportional. Yeah. Just proportional. Don't be, not going to come on YouTube, but she's going to build up her channel eventually here, so. Okay. Well, and this is the thing, that, that feeling that you get, that emotional tug that you get when you're around a guy that has certain qualities, that would be our um, nature speaking to us. And so we have to do work mentally in order to choose the guy that would be more appropriate. And how do we know this? Well, anytime that you are short on your faculty, so let's say you're tired or you are, you've are you been running and you don't have time to think and you just have to pick and go off your gut instinct. That's why it looks like a certain type of person versus if you had time to sit down and think and uh, weigh out the pros and cons, you might get a different person. Cause there was a lady that said, what we want and what we need are usually two different men. That's why, because our wants are still primal. They're still instinctual. They're still exactly. responding to the past. Yep. But in our, when we have time, when we have free will and we have freedom to think and we made a life of convenience, we don't need certain things. And now to keep up that convenience, we need people who are not necessarily protecting our um, our community physically. But so now we need a person that is that can sit still, that will pay attention to computers and things like that. 
So you have to sit down and think about things like that in order to get to a man that will help you go forward in the world that we created with convenience. So we did that in the the nature, the nurture. I'm sorry, I don't talk about nature the, the, I know it's it's hard yeah. to nature nurture. I know nature, it's nature. When I hear it, but I don't say it <laughs> like often at work. So we we you know we created our environment the way we wanted it to be because I guess we were tired of being run you know frizzled or and ragged with all of what we had to do in the past. So my point for all of this, my point for bringing all of this up is that the discrepancies that we get between um, why one man will hear one thing or his experiences with, with women are a certain way versus another one is usually due to that, who we're responding to. We get the choice. We get to decide if we want to respond to our instincts. Or There are some people that feel like I can't be in a relationship with a person that doesn't instinctually speak to me. And I'm going to get bored because I'm required to do cognitive work to stay there. She and then there are other people that she feel will. like I need that because I don't want to always be on my instincts all the time. I want to rest sometimes. So but then that woman, the woman who, and this is just real, okay? And I'm sorry, but, and this goes, this isn't just for us and from 10,000 years ago. It goes across lots of other animal species, including our own, and you can see it, okay? Men who are, say, rated objectively a uh, four to six. Okay. First of all, they have to work on other skills, um, you know, their intangible qualities, right? That's why they're funnier and they're nicer and they're sweeter and they're more romantic, right? right. And they give better head. Why? Because they have to, right? You, 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 and women women know the same thing. Out. Nobody right? talked to them anyway. So, <laughs> right? only but see, the ones that are the four to six that did that achieve those that we talked to, because if they didn't and they're just a four to six and they have nothing else, well, well, why well, they here, right. So, Here's the thing, I, Ruby. You said something that touched on something, and, and Adrian, I want your impact on um, uh, input on this. And I'm well. gonna oh my god, poor thing! You haven't talked yet. Okay, I'm gonna shut up. I'm so let me, sorry. Let me say this, and then I want to pass the mic to AJ. Um, one of the things, and, and, and this, as I grow, I realize this is one of those things that can be two sides of a very ugly coin. It can be true and horrible at the same time. I was told, if you're gonna have a relationship with a woman. Make sure she's what you would call an adjustable eight, a very pretty woman. But any woman who is a nine or a 10, some guys say nines and tens belong to the game. And the problem is if her whole life she's gotten a little less static because she was cute, because she was stunningly beautiful, when she's older and those looks were off, she's not going to be able to help you secure the bag that you just went out and earned. She's not going to be able to do those small problem solving things that a woman who simply is a very pretty Facts. woman, but might have to learn other things to to get through life. Well, that's the woman Facts. you can say, hey, listen, you're good for more than just sex. You're good for we can have sex and the next day, I can talk to you about, I don't know, investments. And you're like, wow, that's interesting. Whereas girls are like, too pretty, they don't know what it's like for someone to say no to them. They don't know what it's like. They, they think that men talk to them because we care about their opinion. No, they don't care. See, that's the thing. A woman who is a nine or a 10, and I was saying the same thing. It works the same way with men. A woman who is a nine or a 10 does not care what you think or if you speak to them or not. They want what they want. They're used to walking through the world and being handed whatever they want. They know you are going to bow to them because they're beautiful. They know that. So they don't have intangible qualities. They don't care if you think about their thoughts or you like their thoughts or not. It doesn't matter to them as long as well, they're getting what they want. It matters later in life. It and later in life, yes. But uh, no, but I'm saying that's the point. <laughs> also don't think about, here's the trick. They also don't think. They, they don't Period. know. And, and the sentence, also, they don't think. think <laughs> here's the analogy I will give, and AJ, I want your thought on this. They're actually in a tunnel, but they think they're in a cave. Meaning, they think they're in a cave full of magic, when in fact they're in a magic tunnel. That tunnel began right after puberty, and they exit the tunnel at a certain age in the future, in her early 30s, if she's lucky. But they don't know that. They think you're in a cave that's going to be in magic candy land forever. AJ? If you black, it's late so, 30s. So I, 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 dis <laughs> I disagree a little bit. From, <laughs> from, a, from, a, from a dude that's, that's dealt with nines and tens, um, what I would say is this, this is what you look for. This is what you look for. Mm -hmm. you, look for uh, you look for ugly ducklings. You look for oh, ugly that's ducklings. different, though. She didn't but, know she was a nine oh, or a ten. That's not the same. That's but, not she's the still same. A, but she's still a nine or ten. So when when she I meet her, I don't. Very cute as a kid and grew up to be a nine or ten. So she's had no. Before. Yeah, she was ugly at some point. So she had to learn yeah, intangible yeah. qualities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. When I'm we're, asking about we're, we're we're not talking about childhood. I'm talking about right after puberty because yeah. that's when girls start to realize their power. Yes. You know, hey, bro. So so some out, some out, some out, bro. 
I lost my virginity when I was 15 to a 31 year old woman. I didn't. Oh, I, 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 bet did. Old. I bet I you did. I bet you did. You were both so sitting up then, right? I, yeah, I was. I was. No, <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't know about. Okay, I don't know about. Okay, honestly, I am sorry that that was your experience. Bye. I'm sorry that was their experience. That I don't think we I don't think we give enough weight to right. what it what it does to have so, what sweetheart, we are young. Sweetheart. No, he's sweetheart. happy come about come it. Come on, no. come on, come on. Let me, Perception let me, is everything. Come on, come on, come on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. AJ's story, let him finish it. Come yeah, on. yeah. So so the reason don't don't feel sorry for me. This is why. Um, number one, I lied to her. I told her I was 21. I used my brother's whole life. Because I was just more advanced at 15. Like, oh I had, I mean, like, AJ, I lied to her. I, I, I hear you, AJ. No 31 year old woman could have a conversation with any 15 year old Sweet child. Hey, no, 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 hey, no, no, no. Hey, let's hey, not do this. Let's hey, not do this. Hey, you know, okay, here, here, here's the thing. Can I say something? Ruby, can I say something? Ruby, hold on. Let's sorry, see you're right. Sorry, AJ. I'm sorry. Serious moment. Shut my mouth. Mm. Mm. I'm glad that you don't feel victimized by it. I absolutely, I am not saying that you should feel victimized by it. That's not it. Um, but hey. I, I will say that it, it disturbs my spirit. But if, okay. if that is your experience, that is your experience. That's, that was my experience. And it was. Okay. <laughs> But see, no, but that's what I'm saying. Listen, and here's the thing. We have to understand that there is a difference between vic being victimized um, and being um, a, a predator seeking prey and young people who are advanced seeking something knowingly what they want. Um, often lying to get what they want and walking out of that situation being happy and satisfied. Now, as a human being who has been victimized and has also been the, the 14, 15 year old lying to people, I can tell the difference. And so for me, because I can tell the difference because I've been in both, um, I'm going to say that it's not fair. And what we can't do is make all of the situations the same. Now, there are boys who were okay, 14, well, 13, 14, I'm, 15. I'm Hold on, let me so finish. Let me finish. Want. One sentence. But just, you know, there were boys who were 13, 14, 15 who were preyed upon by 31, 40-year-old women. And then later they changed their minds to think, oh, well, it must have been a good thing because all my boys said so. But he's saying, no, 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 no. I wanted that woman. I started off lying to her and I pursued her because I wanted her. That's a different situation. We have to look at it as far as, uh, you know, she obviously knew she was getting a younger man. She just thought she was getting a younger man. Um, and, and he looked old enough, he was tall enough, and he could pass off being a 21 year old uh, young man, and he did. You know what I mean? So it's a little different because he pursued it. So, from the beginning. Before, before I give in my, my opinion, opinion. like yours. Um, what? Hold on, guys. Someone's knocking at my door. Was just, well, okay. I mean, I, I, I have some opinions, but I was curious on where he was going with that and how it related to why nines and tens need. You know, like I was, well, the reason I asked about the ugly duckling thing is because I was trying to see if that's what he was referring to. Is he saying that it's okay to get a nine to 10 that is pretty now, but wasn't so much and she had to glow up in a, in a sense? Is that what you meant by ugly duckling? Yeah, that's what I'm like. Cause as okay. as when when you meet when you meet a chick that's a nine or 10, you don't know if she was an ugly duckling or not. All right. you can do is talk to her and then you find out from her story, from how she acts, if she was an ugly duckling or not. And if, even if she was a nine or ten, like yo, not so. So this is the thing about this is the thing about the rating scale, right? I have lived in two very amazing places for women: Atlanta, Georgia, and Medellin, Colombia. You can find a nine and ten all day that's been cute all her life, but she competes with so many other nines and tens that yeah. she doesn't feel that way, right? That's, that's how Brazil is the same way. But but this is what I'll say before is we get that to that. Not a nine and ten then anymore because so if everybody's a nine and ten then she's not a nine. No, no. Here's the thing. And I'm going to say something sexist. Ready, Topaz? As a okay. woman, I understand why you think that, but that's actually not how we think. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what I'm asking, because I definitely know that y'all have different thoughts than I do. So I just need to know when they come out. So, so we, we actually do this thing. We actually do this thing. Me and my homeboys. We'll say, is she Atlanta 10? Or is she an Alton 10? Alton is where I'm from. It's a little bitty town, right? Those are different 10. Is she a Medellin 10 or is she a San Antonio 10? Two different 10s. Let me, no, let the, me the rating that the woman me. gets is just the rating is what it is concrete, regardless of uh, other people. But, but, but here's the market, market, market ranking. Market 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 market. And that's something that a lot of women have a hard time with. 
We right. either if you're pretty you know, women, I know know very oh, well no. what a market ranking is. Huh? I'm like, I, I I would have to push back because I've yet to meet a woman who does not understand a market ranking, who doesn't understand that her cuteness in San Antonio is different than her cuteness in LA or her mm-hmm. cuteness in DC. So mm-hmm. I'm like, well, yeah, and that's how I've been talking about Meaning if you're in Medellin, that means everybody looks like that. Everybody is what you say was a nine or a 10. So that means her ranking market is, well, I think I guess I'm having trouble with the part about how the market relates. Like, so does that that mean that oh, okay well whatever now i can treat you like a five because you are in fact average over here but if we were somewhere else i would have to treat you like the nine or ten because you're not average over there yes mm-hmm. okay yeah. but then I, would, I would tell Let you me, that before, before, Suzette, before we go too okay. far away i want to address what aj said about the 31 year old woman because i think there there's more than one right answer on the one hand i'm totally glad that it didn't bother you if that's an experience that didn't scar you it didn't scar you. Um, there are differences between men and women. I would feel totally different if you were a 15 year old girl. Difference being a man can't be coerced into sex the way a woman can, meaning a man can't be tricked or scared into being sexually aroused or being forced into it. It just doesn't happen that way for us. The second thing is Suzette was also right. For you to believe, even now, I understand this is part of your growing up, for you to believe a 30, 31 year old woman didn't realize completely that you were only 15 and that you were lying about everything you said, that's part of the fantasy. She knew exactly what she was doing and she was wrong. I'm not no. saying you were victimized, no. but at 31, I, she I, I disagree. was dead wrong. I, dis- I, disagree, I disagree too. I'm, I'm going to tell, tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why I disagree with you. At 15, I have a, I have the, the person's identity who I use. At 15, I looked older than him. My voice was deeper than his. I knew his entire life. She asked me questions. Like we had conversations because I grew up as his protege. I knew how to talk to older chicks because I've listened to him my whole I life. You. If you've been schooled so like that, you AJ, 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 you check, this check, this out. Out. check this out, AJ. You've never had a girl you walk up to or talk to her and she's got all the right things to say. Her body is developed, but you immediately hear that voice that's like, oh, I need to start running. She's not 18. That Typically because she says something that lets me know she's not 18. Because she says well, she something. Me. Exactly. He, See, Biden I've had that problem. Said when he said he adopted the character of his older brother. He became that's, his older brother. There I was, was no older right. brother. Like, that's what himself. I'm saying. He locked that's what, yo, I, I was born January 11th, 1976. I was a Capricorn. I graduated in 1994. I could have told her my social security number back then. I told her right. shit I was on. I told so her all his life That's what I'm saying. Found out about the older... Oh, nice. No, okay. see, AJ, here's the thing. Game recognizes game. I'm just saying because I did it, because I was there, I get it. I you get it. You know how to pull it off. Yeah. You know how to pull it off. I did it. And listen, I was... Okay, well, you know... I, I'm not going to go there because it's not that kind of stream. But, you know, some people know some of my stories of my younger days. And see, my thing was I, I liked male attention and I liked getting head. It wasn't really about anything else. And I never did anything else with grown, much older men. Uh, you know what I mean? They weren't coercing me. I was sitting there, <laughs> you know, giving the little tease and the little whatever. But the thing is, is that my, my interest and my mind was always further than I was as far as development, as far as age. Um, so I always had a, an issue fitting in with people my age as it was. Um, so in general, my friend group was several years older than me to begin with. In general, when I would go to parties, like as a 12 year old or a 13 year old or whatever, I was always sitting and then, you know, the 25 year olds were the people who were my friends by the end of the day, because I didn't relate to people my age. Um, yeah. Right, and you so, can make someone a victim who does not feel that they were victimized. right, and I know what it is to be we victimized. To we're not no. allowed to do that because they, no. you know, written that story however they need to, and we can't. Play, we should. But it's not even how we need, need to. It's just about how it is, you know. And I think so that's far. the thing. I think we have to unwrite some people who've convinced themselves, but not everyone has convinced themselves they weren't a victim to to live right. with it, right? And I do so think that have, there's a distinction. Can I ask you to read something so let me, for me clarify. Let me clarify my position. Okay, I am not saying that AJ was victimized. That is not. It is not that. It is that there, um, because of my own experiences and knowledge, there are always power dynamics that are present in any sexual dynamic. And that is as an adult, that is as a child, is period. That is what the BDSM world is built on, is power dynamics. Mm-hmm. So, and it's an acknowledgement of that. I think that 
early sexual experiences that have very wide variances in power dynamics are not always the most supportive of healthy emotional and sexual development. That is not to say that that anyone is victimized, it's saying that I would have liked a different experience for you because I know that there are ways that there are ways that when you have that kind of power dynamic, that there are needs that aren't met just because of the dynamics at play. So it is not a it's not a castigation mm-hmm. on your experience. It's not saying that you have to see yourself as victimized. It's more a you know shame on this woman for for she letting can, that be the dynamic. Exactly. That's so, what, can I ask you to yeah. read something for me? Yes. I thought like, that. Things I want you to look at. Good time. Read that out loud for us. Also, here in Brazil, black women could never be a ten, not in the eyes of other Brazilian men, at least for a while. So I'm guessing that she's been told and indoctrinated this. You know, if she grew up in Brazil, she she's been you know taught this to internalize it. Black women here are hypersexualized, right? And and by the world, the world sexualizes Brazilian women. But they were definitely not the pretty ones when they were kids. That that's why Americans go down there and they be like lose their mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. They go down there and they lose their mind. Right. They More. Be like, that's yeah. all I ever hear about. More. How sexy Brazilian women have been since like the dawn of the century. That's yeah. I that's one of the top women I've always them and Bayesian women. Always. But really? you know, that has not been my experience about Bayesian women. <laughs> What? My my uncle man, he said that in front of his wife. He would leave her for a Bayesian woman. Lord. <laughs> Go ahead. And that is and that is I did. I read it. And that is, you know, what we are dealing with. And it's the worldwide. It's not just here in America. Racism is in fact a problem. Your skin color automatically gives you certain characteristics that but wait, wait, wait. Continue it, reading. Okay. Continue reading. What's on the screen? I did. When black women are kids in Brazil, they're a part of the ugly duck until they're at least twenty. Now because watch what that. Are you because cupping what? her boobs? Sorry. <laughs> in the picture? Is that what you're doing? Are you cupping her boobs in the picture? Because what is considered beautiful here is white blonde women. Yes, that is definitely a boob cup. <laughs> That's a boob cup. All right, then. It was a good vacation, right? It was. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> and I, that's why I'm to, because I don't want her to have to live with that. I'm sorry that she had to go through that, and I don't want kids growing up going forward to have to go through that. But I know exactly what she's doing. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's and it's been my experience. Like I will tell you that you know the reactions that you get are very different depending on where you are and and what is considered ideal and how close do you fit the physical and how close you fit the face and the hair and it's it's a whole rigmarole it's a whole rigmarole and that is because the, here, of the, environment, the environment wants to keep certain women as i own this woman and so they have a standard of what they think that is and for whatever reason to recreate that standard in their kids so that the future men will also want to keep those women and for unfortunately for black women our skin color has been something that has de- demarcated us instead of elevated us and that's what she's discussing right I'll, now. I'll, I'll tell you something. When she said, so I agree, nine and ten women have always had it easy so they don't get a no for an answer, might be different for a black woman. AJ, you, I think you touched on this earlier. Like, I came to Brazil, and I was looking around, and I was like, can somebody explain to me how half these women just walk into the store don't have a modeling contract? And I mean of no. all sizes, from the four-foot women to the six-foot women, the women that weigh 200 pounds with giant breasts to the tiny ones, I'm like, how do these women not have modeling contracts? And then you look around and you realize, wait a minute, just by being black, they got cut out of the market. Then you it's start- like that. It's like that in Medellin. It's, it's, I mean, you meet you meet women here that are like, good God. And I mean, they walk with their head down. You'd be like, yo, you are beautiful. Like, yo, I could take you to Atlanta, Miami, Chicago, New York, LA, and you will shut the street down. But they, it's, they, it's, they it's, don't see themselves like that. Well, you know, so maybe this will help you guys understand. Remember we were talking about how for men, they do these activities and these behaviors so that they understand the pecking order that they have amongst other men. Women do the same. Yeah. We do the same. And we look at who, who gets resources, who is selected. Right. 
Who is it who gets these benefits? Who gets the pretty privilege and who doesn't? Who gets right. pulled into the club and who gets turned away? All of and those things, and those are the things that let us know yeah. where exactly. Those are the things that let us know where in the pecking order do we lie? Where in the, the, the market rate? do we place and so you know when we talk about blooming where you're planting or going where you're desired that's where that comes from because men good bad and different y'all aren't y'all are not stupid but sometimes you're not smart and you let your preferences kind of lead the way and it and women observe and they see what are the characteristics that allow them to traffic and collect resources and which ones are not well here's something interesting and and Again, AJ, you and I being the, the two men who travel a bit, uh, it was interesting to talk to her about different things and realize, and this is something you as women really understand, when she realized that she could get what she wanted the hard way by showing people that she has a university education and speaks two languages and is studying a third, or just wears some cleavage down here, and it got her the same access to the like. <laughs> we we'll get her more, actually. Exactly. And, 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 and you have, but sometimes that like. stops you from getting it the earnest way. So you know, it's a lot of things at play. There are a lot of women who could have made it that way, but were prevented from doing so because they get stopped and told, "But wait, but you're pretty. You don't have to read these books. You need to put the books down and come out here and let some man take care of you. You're so lucky. Every woman wants that. You're ungrateful by trying to read." Now, now, AJ, when you went. To, True. When you travel abroad and you deal with different women or different races, are black women afraid of you? Um, I think they're I think they're curious. I, I think they're more curious. Like, why is he talking to me? Like, what does he say to me? I had the same thing. White women in Brazil were on my neck, and I have nothing. Yeah, to get white. Them. Yeah, white women expect. Like, Holy that. shit. They yeah. would just, Ugh! and I'm like, yeah. well, how come when I say hi to a black girl, they will cross the street? And I'm like, I'm handsome, I'm in shape, smile a lot. And they were like, they were just, they, black American guy, they were just a little, a little apprehensive that I'm not just going to do a But dirty. you know what? I think, I think it goes back, I think it goes back to what the women were saying, where you don't want a pretty boy because you know he has options. So they don't want a black American because they know the white, the, the females that they think are pretty are all on you. They know that. Like, I've had females tell me, like, yo, I can't mess with you because my friends going to try to get it. And I'm like, I've had women say to me, oh, you date black girls? And I was like, well, not exclusively, but yeah, she fits the requirements. And they're that shocked. is the question. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are some men who are very, who are very vocal in, in their preferences. And um and so like I said, you know, um for a lot I think that women are not blind, deaf and dumb. They see what what people what options are available, they see what people pursue, they see what they respond to, and they conduct themselves accordingly. Like, I mean, people are rational beings at the end of the day men and women will make the decisions that appear to be rational for for the most part the the, mm -hmm. the bell curve you know most of the people in the middle are gonna try to make decisions that seem to make sense and if it tell and if you see all the women on the neck <laughs> like they're like okay in this marketplace can i beat off with a stick on these women or do i look at what my options are and move ahead accordingly you know i See, mean you know what though like when i think about myself for example it took like so people who were born in 1984 it took them a long time to actually find me attractive compared to the rest of society so i became attractive to let's say people who were a few years old like yeah. say two three years older uh, than me i became attractive to them before i became attractive to yes. my own um yes. and so i didn't Right. So I didn't know I was generally attractive or, you know, because your whole world is your little fishbowl in school. Right. So I didn't know that I was generally attractive until I was a lot older. Um, right. So I knew I could be selectively attractive. Right. And so I, I would zero in on that and I would just focus on that attention. Right. And so that attention made me feel beautiful and I knew I would search for, for that. Right. But I didn't think that, oh, well, I was I'm an eight or I'm a nine. I didn't think I was really up there because generally the boys in my grade want nothing to do with me. 
right? The boys in my class want nothing to do with me. They're chasing Vicky and this one and this way. Everyone but me, it seemed like, right? They looked around me, above me, underneath me, right? And then, like, you know, these guys who were older, even, like, you know, like, men, right? They'd be like, oh, I wish you were a few years older and stuff like that. And I'd be like, yeah, right. Like, you know, they're just trying to be nice. I didn't understand they weren't just trying to be nice until years later. When I hit about, I'll say, 16, 17, 18, that's when I figured out, oh, people think I'm attractive. I didn't know that, right? Like, you know yeah, what I like mean? Like, if I ever left school for a second, I would know what's in the real world. But yeah, right. I've had good experience too. Exactly. And see, that what and opinion. what happens is, the reason why we don't know that is because we are biologically, again, going evolutionary programming, we are biologically Hold on, wait, programmed. I Ruby, Ruby, I hate interrupting people, but again. actually, Ruby, I feel comfortable interrupting you because I know you don't I think noticed. You like you, You're like me. You'll just keep talking, right? Everybody, Erica Williams, okay, in the chat Yo, right now, I want, you to, whoo, I want you to stop what you're doing, okay? And I need you to go click on her channel. Yo, like, I, met, I, hey, to her. I met her in Austin. When I was in Austin, Texas, we met up. Erica is so dope. Oh, all right. I will do I this. Want everybody, listen, you, you subscribe to her channel, you're going to learn something. Yeah. Okay. All you're right, going to learn this. something. This is one of the few people I can say, you don't have to ask any questions. If you trust my word at all, I want you to go click on Erica Williams. And whenever you comment on her video, say, hey, make sure you go hang out at Watif's page, too. You're going to learn something from Erica. All right. Yeah, right, done and done, done, sir. Done and done. done. Right. I thought Honest. I was going to do it, but yeah, I am definitely now. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Hey, Ruby, you said something that's interesting, though, because like when I talk to females now, I think it's like I, I tell females, like, yo, I'm an attractive dude with ugly residue. Because, mm -hmm. like, that residue from my childhood of being no, ugly. Just facts. I'm yeah. serious. I'm no, serious. No, that's what it is. That's an way to put it, though. No, it's, like, it's, it's just the nice of how you put it. It's very true. Yeah, but I'm, it's mm -hmm. hilarious. I'm a, I'm a handsome dude with ugly residue because yeah. I don't, I don't feel, I, I don't feel, like, I don't feel what people say. Right. I feel like, I feel like the same kid that females would say, I want you to be my brother instead of my man. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes. like I'm yep. still that dude. I'm still that dude. So Exactly. And you know why? It's because, okay, so biologically, right? So you go back to evolutionary psychology. So at first we care a lot about what our parents think, obviously, right? Then people in our household, then authority figures. But around middle to late childhood, we start really caring what our peers have to say, right? And it's because... In order for us to survive and to reproduce, be successful as it is as humans, we have to be successful in our peer group. Those are the people yeah. and generally that we're going to be mating with, that are going to, you know, we're going to be in social structures with, right? So we have to learn how to be successful with them. And so these people who maybe see us as the ugly ducklings from the second grade, they don't see us like, because they just see us every day. They don't see us changing or whatever, right? They're going to keep treating us like we're a four or two or right. nothing, right? But the outside world is looking at us objectively, but we, we don't care what they think. We're not supposed yeah. to. Right. It takes us a while because because basically all the other grades, all the other ages, they might as well be outside tribes. They don't count to us. Yeah. Uh, right. It takes us a while for us to um, get that executive functioning in and, and stop looking at them as separate tribes and start looking at them as, oh, these are th these are my peer group, too. Oh, I should be treated walking around like I'm attractive and expecting people to just do this, that and whatever for me, because whatever. But no, but you already developed the non sexual attributes that the average ugly person does. Um, right. Because you didn't know that, hey, one day I'd be able to flounce around and, you know, not have to think and not have to read a book and not have to this and not have to that. Um, yeah, hey, you might even have a sense of humor. You might have a great personality, which makes you a catch. And that's where, you know what, going back to what you said initially with the adjustable eight. Right. That is what makes um, some people an amazing catch, because you have the genetics that if you didn't know better. Or if someone had told you better, you would you would have the genetics, but you would suck as a person, but no one did. So you developed all the personality traits, all of the attitudes, all of the great characteristics that, you know, that maybe the three or four does. Um, but you also have the nine, ten genes 
So like right. you're an amazing catch. Like by the time we get to like mid uh, adulthood, everyone's chasing you now. Now everyone's like, oh my god, you're such husband material. Are you married? Do you have a brother just like you? You have a best friend just like you, right? That's why. That's when, that's when they tell us that the nines and tens are, are insecure. Well, this is a different type of insecurity that comes out in people that aren't nines and tens. That's when it starts to show is because we, you now are, um, for the first time, being confronted with the question, were they telling the truth? Then nobody, like, you never even thought to question that. Wait, wait, wait you lost me. Oh. Who? Your peers, your parents, yeah. the people who are like, oh, but you're people so that were cool. telling, yeah. The people you grew up with, the old church lady. <laughs> like, those Whatever box you are putting in, into it in childhood, that is what you question when you first go off to college. That's why that freshman year is well, You know what was interesting? And I tell people this all the time. I'm not cool. I have never been cool. I just right. started lifting weights and getting educated because I used to get beat up for wearing, you know, this is the, this is, this is my Darth Vader dark side of the force tank top. I, know. <laughs> right. I, know. I used to get awesome. beat up for wearing stuff like this. I was a nerd. I went to bed till I was like 14. I didn't pop out of my mother's womb like this, but I, it's interesting that when people who knew me as a child interact with me in the adult world, they have a hard time understanding that respected business and pay me for my time and my opinions on business mm -hmm. matters. They have a hard time with me seeing a way. Now they're questioning, were we right for saying that he wasn't going to be anything? Because when they write you off as a kid for being a nerd, it's because you're not good socially. And they feel like that's going to translate into the real world when we all grow up until they learn differently. So they and, are concerned with the question is, well, wait a minute. Were we right when we said he wasn't going to be well, anything? Well, here's the thing, though. Is Talking about that masculinity thing, I had a couple good mentors. Guys mm -hmm. that I didn't realize till I was older, they realized he ain't got nothing to lose. So you might as well try and teach him something. And I listened. And sure enough, I didn't know that most men that were short weren't supposed to have access to women the way I did. I had no idea that I was supposed to be scared to walk up to a woman and get, I tell people all the time, I would give a woman every opportunity in the world to say, no, I don't want you, but I'm going to find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which There's is an interesting phenomenon that happens. Yeah, it, like, there are attractive it, girls that might ha uh, wear glasses or either be into comic books or something, and then, so they, they just put their hair in a ponytail or something. But they have all of the features, and you know how they have all of these movies about where you find the, the uh, dirty girl. Yeah, and then yeah, somebody gives them a makeover because they realize the beauty underneath or whatever. Like that phenomenon exists it. for a reason. <laughs> and the reason is because, is because we do make snap judgments. And that is like you when when Ruth was mm -hmm. talking earlier, we like we meet our friends in kindergarten, right? And we stay with those friends unless anything happens until twelfth grade. So what they tell you, how they categorize you, not only do you you have no choice but to internalize it, it would be abnormal for you to be able to not mm -hmm. because it's what you see every day, all day, and then you see your parents all day on the weekends. But this is where you spend the biggest group of your time. They treat you as such, block off any alternatives for you to act any differently until you now become that character. So that's how you get the ugly duckling. You get the woman who never knew that she was attractive. And most men would look at her now and be like, oh, I don't believe that. You know that you're attractive. I think that you're trying to play me. You know that you could go out there and do whatever or get whatever. And she literally doesn't know. And so mm -hmm. it or, and, and I will and, and I will I will speak in for the average girls because um you know being being a being a blurred um as a as a girl is a very interesting experience. <laughs> um, you know, and so um because people tell you that's the community point, that you're the small right, there comes a point where the the world of um attractiveness, let's call it, right? That realm. Um, it's seen as something very separate. Like growing up, um, and even as an adult to this day, like um, I do not receive male attention. So I have learned not to rely <laughs> on male attention because <laughs> it was never an option. It was literally right. never an option. Um, and Wait, so- you think you don't get it? Or, and this is something I do want to touch on, do you not get it? Or is it something that I see and a lot of my other men friends see is that women only, it, it doesn't count if you're not one of the men that's already too qualified and attractive. Darling, you're talking to me. Wait, wait, <laughs> AJ, did, I, AJ, did, I get, did I get a text from you? Yeah. I, 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 I have, so, so, so hold I on, hold on. I believe that men are giving you attention too. Cause I mean, so, 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 so this is the thing. Me, so I didn't think hold on, let AJ, let AJ get in the game. Hold on. And then so I this is the thing. Afterwards. 
Um, and I, I have a, I have a client, I have a client and one of the things that she was dealing with was she was like, yo, no man wants me. She's a doctor. She's beautiful. She's all this. And she was saying how no man wanted her. She wouldn't get attention. But then when I broke down her day, I'm like, yo, you turned down five dudes. Yeah. And I, and please understand three quarters of my female friendship circle. That is the case. Um, I am not one of those women. <laughs> And the reason why I say that is because um, my male friends did not believe me until I moved to DC and they got to see what I am talking about. <laughs> and I am like, there is something about my energy or how I present in a room or however it is. And I think a lot of it came from being that introverted, you know, nature that is just is a part and parcel of who I am for whatever reason. Um, when men engage with me, they engage with me because of shared interests, because there's a conversation, because th there is something I have to do to engage them in me. That is how I got into BDSM. That is how I got into BDSM. Because they have own, common interests? Do you know how hard that is? Right. Hey, however, guess what? Guess what men love to do to me? They love to have wonderful conversations to me about their dreams, hopes, and inspiration, and tell me which one of my friends they want to fuck. All right, like, but, but that's not like this is the thing. You get it's quality not, interactions, though. Not a bad thing. Please don't misunderstand right. me. Like I treasure the fact that so many men that I had, like I have a very wide and loving circle of male friends and associates, and I treasure the fact that I'm able to create safe spaces with them that they feel that they can share their intimate thoughts that they do want to talk about their emotions and what they're going through and i've convinced quite a bit of them to pursue therapy and different dreams so i am very happy with whatever it is in me that brings that about however i will say that as a sexual woman it does become challenging when the getting men to see you as a sexual option seems to be a challenge. And um, part of that just, like I said, comes from a variety of different parameters in that. Now, the fact like that can I say something? Though? Huh? Has that always been the case for you in your opinion? Yes. Yes, that Even has before always you became been highly educated. That has always that has always been really? the case. You know what? From if I could say something, even, that has always been. Ruby is being like, so polite. For example, I have hand. never been. I have never been. Like, yeah, hold on, stop the show. Ruby raised her hand. Oh, yeah, okay, Ruby. Ruby. You know, I do that when you can't see me. Like, when I go, can I say something? I do it like I'm in school. I don't know. It's just <laughs> <laughs> that's how I was raised. I don't know. <laughs> they beat it into you. Um, no, I wanted to say this, though. Um, and, you know, I did a video on this. It wasn't on why you can't find a man. It was on how why you can't find a good man. Um, and it has to do with um, another trick that our brains do to us um which you know can backfire i mean sometimes it's good it's just a lot of times these days it's bad is what we do is we look in like in nature to try to find things that confirm our preconceived notions or ideas about life overall so the problem is, is we have a preconceived notion or idea about life um you know in my video i said you know that all men ain't shit then you wake up in the morning even though you think you're looking for a good man you're gonna go out there and all you're gonna do subconsciously is only look for I recognize and remember all the Asian dudes because you're looking for stuff in the environment right. that confirms what you already believe. Confirmation no. bias. Yes. Confirmation <laughs> bias. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if, if you believe that when you wake up in the morning, you say, okay, I'm going to go get a guy. You, the end of that sentence that you're not saying out loud is I'm going to get a, go get a guy. And I know they ain't shit. So like, yeah, you right. Already, you made your peace you, with that. So you don't turn away. You know, like, that's why I tell people about the thoughts that you have. Because if you feel like all men ain't shit, whenever you say, okay, well, screw this, whatever it is has to be big enough for you to say, I'm willing to put up with all the ain't shitness that they're getting ready to bring. So you right. make your peace with the fact that that's what you're going to get instead of saying, and, and then you don't, like, you don't trust if a guy comes up to you and he is, he is about something, you know? So then it's, but no, then he you won't even notice it. In that. Oh, yeah, yeah, you brush him off. So, now, so and see, that's know, what I was going to say. So I, now going I, to I, your I, situation. I completely understand that. The, the, no, no, because your situation is different, though, but oh, it's the yeah, same. Yeah, and I'm going to explain, right? I'm going to explain why your situation is different, but the same. 
Yeah, no, no, no. But you know, sorry, I can't help it. It's what I do. Um, so now the thing is, hazard. You bring psychology. Yeah, yeah. It's sorry. It's what I do. Um. But you know what? This is the thing, right? So if you've told yourself, right, which is true, right? I don't get that attention, right? Men are not interested in me. The men who are who are interested in me or who will respond positively to me are the ones who want to be my friend. Guess what you're going to go out there, notice, interact with in your life? The ones who want to be your friend. Completely right? understood. So, okay, so let me give so let me give some let me give some examples for why it is that, that, I don't, that I don't believe in a minute, Yusuf. Let me explain. <laughs> <something>. <laughs> <She> <laughs> <does>. <laughs> right. So, for example, like I like I um I often tell people the one of the things is like for in all of my in my childhood, adolescence, and adult life, I've never been catcalled, ever. Mm. I've never I've never had a coercive sexual experience. I've never been approached in any kind of provocative way. I've never had a man to like, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, I understand exactly what you're saying, which is why I do. There's a lot of internal work that I've done not to believe that the world is this asexual place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because but that's what I'm the saying, same thing that happens. Something, oh, nobody, nobody, is no. something. nobody is something. There is some element, right. And there is some element, there is something about how it is that I show up. I don't know what that element is, but I know that it is there and it is consistent mm -hmm. because it happens across experiences, across populations. And so that's that's kind of what I'm saying is like, it has shaped, it definitely has shaped my expectations. Yeah. I think that's part of the reasons why I am so comfortable speaking about sexual things and addressing sexual issues. Because for me, men just don't have that kind of dynamic. So they're able mm -hmm. to hear and engage with me in a way that mm. does not lead down that path the way it may for other women who who just present or show up in the world differently. Adrian, Adrian, look at what brother Craig Washington put in the window and, and shout out to Craig Washington. He's going to get his channel up and running. Um, he has an amazing voice and personality. He's been on the on the show with me a couple times. In the age of Me Too, U.S. version, it's difficult for men to approach women in a way that's considered forward yet non-threatening. Guidelines are murky at best. <laughs> Not that, and, that, and, that. and you don't and you don't look fragile and you know and and that's the thing men who are really attracted to you might be exactly the kind of guy who's either fearful fearful of, of you know uh, causing offense or whatever or automatically brushes themselves off because they figure that a woman like you would not want someone who's like them absolutely right? which is why i sexually approach men all day every day <laughs> I love you. I ain't picking no more. I'm just trying to find someone. You. them into reality. Having a conversation with me, bro. So, so I have a question. I have a question. I have a question for you, because Yusuf, help me out. Because if I'm if I'm off base, please help me. I have never went and talked to as since I've been an adult, a mature adult man. I have never went up to a woman and talked to her and had a great conversation so I could holler at her friend. Now, if she isn't showing me the attention that I want and she I keeps bringing kidding. her friend up, then I'm going to be like, well, shit, what's up with your friend? Because clearly you're mentioning your friend. Like, I ain't said nothing about your friend. AJ, AJ, one day I'm going to get a video cam <laughs> because... Believe me <laughs> when I tell you. <laughs> so, but, but my question is, you say you say they come and holler at you about your friend. I will tell you, I will How tell do they you, even know they're your said, friend? I would tell you, like she's in a place with them and they interact and then they like her because of their shared interest in her personality. And then once the friends are brought up for whatever reason, like let's say they were all if out they, for dinner, or so whatever. let's say we're at a happy hour. Then they let's say, say we're at a happy hour. hour. You know, I would have a whole conversation. Rainbow, exactly. That I need to address, she said. But friends before lovers' relationships are great. No, 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 no they're not. It's a horrible idea. No man should ever. Horrible. Start I do not call my friends. Friends. <laughs> We will have to have a conversation about that. If you are a man watching this, do not ever try to be a friend with a woman you actually want to put your dick into. That's a terrible well, idea. See, if you're not my friend what? first, though, I won't fuck you. That's I just real. I would do some friend. sideways well, back that's door. So, that's so, you feel like they're your friend, but so, they are not being your friend. I will friend. say this. So, you no, be, exactly. Friend or lover. I'm friend for life. A perspective of somebody under six foot. 
somebody over six foot says it's okay to be friends before lovers. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, <laughs> see, okay, can I say something? Let me let me see this. Let me see this. Let me see this. Hold on. Okay, go you said sorry, your channel. Go ahead, go ahead. Wait, wait, AJ, listen. I didn't have a single woman in my life that was a friend of mine until I was over 30. At uh, Below that, I didn't even know I needed to have friends that were women because there was nothing that other guys that I knew couldn't provide for me. There was only one thing women were good for before that age where I got mature enough and I was happy enough with some other things. But the reality is having a woman as a friend for a man is a terrible idea. Now, I understand some men play that friendship game. That's why I tell women don't fall for it. If you don't have the courage to say that. I have have male friends. I'm looking for a a girlfriend, a lover. A man did not say that. I want to say that for a reason. Deeply disagree. Some of the most profound and intimate relationships I have in my life are from my male friends. Yes. I have had male friends my entire life. I have male friends that I've talked to since I was 13 years old, and we are still friends. I attend their weddings. I babysat their children. I'm friends with spouses. They do it. They don't like it. I, I would tell you, no, I would tell you that's so, one of the things, that's one of the curses of my life. Like I said, like, I, I wish that I had the caliber of sexual relationships to that match the caliber of my friendships. My male, my circle of male friends are oh. amazing. Amazing. So, I'm going to do like you. I'm going to do like you, Ruby. I know, like I know, I know. I, know. Like I, I tried to keep it like down, you. but then I'm like, wait, okay, no, please. I have something to ask. Because that made me think of something. Okay, so. Because I am also, like, listen, I'm one of the boys to the point where, like, seriously, my male friends, though, don't see me as a woman. It's very, yeah. it's a very strange dynamic. Yeah, so I get, yeah, I, yeah. no, yeah, no, yeah. no, I'm telling you, get hold naked. on, like, get naked. Get naked. Yeah, no, no, trust me, get if naked. I did, they'd be like, ill. like, it would be gross to them. I'm not kidding. My male friends, hold on, no, listen, I'm telling you, my male friends do not see me as a woman. Men see me as a woman. I'm saying my male friends do not. So here's my question now for you. Um, does your energy, when you are approaching a guy that, yeah, you might want to get to know him on a friendly level, but you're attracted to him. Does your energy change when you're speaking to that man? Um, because it has to be different. Okay. So for me, Mm -hmm. when I approach an attractive man, I am not approaching him to be my friend. Okay. I have, I have no need for friends. I have a, pl- a robust and complete friend circle. Right. So okay. my energy when the, it, it is it is very clear. Mm-hmm. Very. <laughs> that my interest in them is one that is sexual. Hmm. Okay. So so, so come on. So let me help you out. Let me help you out, right? Uh-huh. Because it's so every man mm-hmm. still loves the chase. So you could come up to me and show you that it's sexual, but then you need to show me that I got to taste you. Yeah. Oh yeah. I am now this is so this is where this is where it becomes difficult to explain the nuance, right? So mm-hmm. because of my background and what I do, I'm very comfortable in sexual situations, right? So flirtations, the the bandying, the pursuit, those are not things that are um intimidating to me or throw me off my game or anything like that. However, I'm also savvy enough and also psychologically sophisticated enough to understand that not all men can respond to that in the same way. And so when so when the gentleman was saying how, you know, in the time of me too, that there are men who are unduly cautious, I understand that so i make i make the opening i know uh, i'm very sensitive about creating the dynamic that allows a man to know that an opportunity is there if he chooses not to pursue it i'm completely okay with letting that opportunity go however i also know that there isn't there isn't the vacitation there isn't this facade like he will know that there is an opportunity there that he could pursue. I'm just not. I'm just not about to make him feel uncomfortable about desiring someone. Like I feel mm-hmm. like desire is a great thing, however way it's expressed. So even if it's he decides not to pursue it with me, mm-hmm. I don't think it's a good thing to try to make him feel bad about feeling desire for anyone. If it's not True. me, it'll be for someone else. True. So that's kind of what I'm saying is that like you know I, I I'm very aware and very cognizant. And I I think a lot of that comes from my therapeutic background. You know, like when you're a therapist, you have to know about transference and counter-transference. How is it that you are creating the space to build rapport? How are you making that person comfortable with engaging with you? But because of that, I'm like, I'm also very good at reading when someone's interest lies in a direction and when it doesn't. And Mm -hmm. um, And so for me, it becomes that 
it's just been a very interesting experience going along my own life's journey because a lot of some of the assumptions that people make about men and how men move and da 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 and how you know like there's there's a social narrative that men are not judicious in their sexual choices that they'll just fuck anything or they'll just do anyone and I am that's like I prove they're not it's not true exactly I'm I am the I am living evidence that that is not the case that you can have lifelong platonic relationships relationships with men that never step outside of that bound. Just like, you know, and so from that's why for the formation of my romantic relationships, like I don't look for friendship because quite honestly, anybody who's engaged with me in any kind of intimate fashion is going to be, is going to have a friendship with me. Like that's just <laughs> what's going to be. So, so, all right. So let me say this about the, the friends before lovers thing, because I use of, I, I disagree with you, but this, this is my, this is why I tell, <laughs> I tell females all the time, become friends with your dude before you become, before you become his wife. I don't say lover, but I do say wife. And this is why. Men will cheat on their wives, but they don't cheat on their friends. Females, the females that I've known, they may, they go through females all the time. They cool with her one second, then they got new friends. A man will have the same friends he had from kindergarten to the day he died. Yeah. Because we understand and believe in friendship Mm -hmm. so if you actually have a for real friendship with a man then a lot of the stuff that women go through you wouldn't go through it because we don't hurt our friends now we've been trying to hurt chicks our whole lives but we don't hurt our friends i completely agree True. I completely agree. Doesn't I don't have more male friends. <laughs> yeah, that's why, I'm like, yeah. that's why I love my male friends. <laughs> I don't disagree with that. Um, what I'm saying, though, is that for me, friendship, I think that what I think that people say become friends or what they mean is be friendly. Meaning mm. that you have a discussion about your values, have a yeah. discussion about, right. you know, be on the same page, share interests, do these things. But being a friend Okay, to me, it's a distinct pathway from being a lover. If you are a friend, it is because that sexual element will not be a dynamic within that relationship. Good, bad, or indifferent. There have been women who fell in the friend category with me after we've had different sex encounters. There are women who have not had, you know, that kind of relationship, and our our relationship changed. Mm hmm. You know? So, and but that's just what I'm saying. I'm like the moment you add sex, whether it's before you become friends or after, the relationship is different. It changes dynamics. It changes power um, issues. It adds emotional and intimacy layers, however way that may play out. And so it is a it is a different dynamic. So either you are friends, or you are lovers. Like I, I in just, your life, in your life. In, in my, in you're absolutely okay. right, in my okay. life. In your and life. So, in my life. And so for that, and that's kind of why I said that, like for some people, they can, they can be friendly. They can be, they can have these things that are hallmarks of what a friendship is and still be sexually intimate. And that's great. I don't dispute that. But for me, in order to maintain the boundaries that preserve friendships, it helps if we are not actively fucking. And that's yeah. why I say I don't fuck my friends. So, so, so my man, uh, Gon, Gonway, I hope I pronounced it right. Gonway the Prodigy. Yeah. He said sex complicates the dynamic. I think I sex think only it complicates it. I, I think, think it, it only happens. complicates it when you're not honest with each other. Exactly. And I'm mean, totally I don't honest. Think it's, right. I agree with you, AJ. I don't think it necessarily complicates. I think it adds layers. It adds dynamics. There are different considerations and different conversations you need to have, but that doesn't necessarily need to be a complication. Well, listen, um, I get the feel. Oh, why is Ruby gone? I hope you Yo, Ruby, Ruby be checking out. <laughs> Ruby be like, hey, give me a minute. Ruby's like, I'll be back, bro. <laughs> Yo, Ruby, Ruby is the girl in class that leaves every five minutes to go to the bathroom. You don't I know where she went. Really that would be me, but I made a conscious effort to sit and be still for one of these podcasts because I am all over the place. I, I don't know. I well, listen, do how about we do this? We Would you believe we've been here two hours? I do. I was looking at that. <laughs> I mean, it does not seem like two hours because I have so much more things that I want to bring up. I appreciate all of y'all coming by. Um, I extra appreciate Topaz and Ruby 
for going with my one concession. I don't let people hide behind their avatar. Let's say, if we're going to talk, we're going to talk and look at each other. Yeah. We are going to have to do this again. There are so many other aspects of this conversation that we have to go into. Right. And I think that's what the thing was happening here. Is everybody kept jumping off the different tangents. But if we know which show is for which tangent, then we can keep it there. Because a lot of things when y'all said something, I was like, okay, but but also in this and yeah. So <laughs> I'm I'm pretty disappointed because I wanted to uh be sharing more of the floor and I kept jumping in. So, you know, we're all I friends. was planning on being polite. <laughs> we're all friends. So listen, we are going to wrap it up. Okay. Here's what I will say. Um I I'm gonna let let's see. Ooh, oh. Snuggle asking good questions. Okay. I know. <laughs> I know. So, Snuggle is trying to keep Snuggle trying to keep us here all night. <laughs> I'm gonna say we are planning part two right now. And let's see. One so, by one, so, we're gonna let we're gonna go by and let everybody have their 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 last words. We're actually gonna we're actually gonna start in the other direction. We'll start with Topaz, then Suzette, then Ruby. <laughs> Ruby, um, you gotta accept it. I do. Why, I you, why you why you gotta sign at me for? Why am I the only one who got to sign? I don't know. I don't know. So, I don't know. Don't I don't know. <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. We're not going to interrupt. What right. do you want to say to us? What do you want us to take away from this? Okay, so my last thoughts on this topic is that I don't, one of the things that I've noticed is that knowledge can be a, a bad thing sometimes. And so what I want is for this conversation to keep going. I don't want for us to say, oh, well, this is the way the world is. And then just do certain things. And we expect that we have to keep doing those same actions for, from now until forever whether we're happy or not, because that's not true. My goal is to get people to know this information and become more of an active part in not only their life, but also in their community. That's well it. said, Topaz, <laughs> well said. Thanks. All right, so my final thoughts. I think that um, there is so much that we don't know about the realm of the human experience, you know? And so all of these things are just different perspectives that allow us to put context to the experiences that we have so that we're not trapped into a cage of our own limited experience. Everything from whether it's evolutionary or whether it's hormonal or whether it comes from social conditioning, all of these things and having these understandings mean that it gives you greater insight so that you can make different decisions and different choices, which is the biggest, the biggest and best way to liberation. And at the end of the day, a liberated life is the life we all should be living. And so good luck on your journey. I think this is a great start. Right. I agree. I thought Ruby was next. I thought. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, my final thoughts is Yo, be be your best self. Be your best self. Well, all we're doing is giving information based on our very limited perspectives and our filters. Um, find what works for you. Use it. If it don't, get rid of it. Uh, I think that we're all our own best coaches. We're all our own best mentors. Um, so if you found something from this, definitely use it. But uh, don't listen to me. I ain't no guru. I ain't no expert on um, none of that um but be the expert in your own life so be your own greatness and uh, uh like she said enjoy the journey all right everybody have a good night i'll talk Wait, to you I'm you so ignorant you are so ignorant you know that you know that i, I see you i see how you treat me i would tell bmt on you uh <laughs> so you know what? Because I'm me and I never let go of anything, I'm going to go back to our conversation at the very beginning um, about um, whether or not um, evolutionary psychology uh, as a discipline even exists. And I'm going to go to something concrete um, as an illustration. And I'm going to compare us to say baby deer. I know it sounds crazy, but hang on to this. 
So we have experiments that we call the visual cliff experiment, right? Where it looks like a cliff, um, but there's glass. So if you were to walk off the cliff, um, you won't die. Um, and now what they've done is they take uh, babies right? Um, newborns, as soon as they can move, as soon as babies can crawl, for example, right? And they put them there in front of the cliff and they see, well, babies crawl off the cliff and they will, um, right? It takes them a little bit of experience in movement for them to learn not to crawl off the cliff. Um, why? Well, you would think to yourself, oh, well, obviously, you know, you would need to experience things in life before you would not crawl off a cliff. That's not so. Baby deer, the second they fall out of mama and they start walking, they will not cross that visual cliff. So why is that? Well, see, this is what evolutionary yeah. psychology tries to tackle. Now I'm telling you about something, you know, physical survival wise, but you know, all, all of our traits, the, the way we engage in, in so society, social contracts, uh, the way that we develop, the way our bodies develop as far as puberty, when we hit it, why we hit it, how we hit it, all of these things, right? This is all in the realm of this evolutionary psychology idea that tries to help us understand why do we do things the way we do them? Why do we, why aren't we just born just knowing how to do everything? Uh, you know what I mean? How can we forget things that we learned five seconds ago? Uh, what instincts will overtake um, social conditioning, right? So, I mean, this is like a realm, it's huge, right? Uh, we're barely scratching the surface of psychology um, as a discipline, really in the last hundred years, we've come leaps and bounds to where we are now, but we're only ba barely beginning to understand humans. Why do we do what we do? These are not easy answers. No one has all of the answers yet. And so, you know, I think these discussions are really important. The more perspectives we can get, whether it's life experience or, you know, different disciplines of study, us coming together and doing these discussions is exactly what we need, I think, uh, to further our understanding of exactly that answer. Well, listen. Wow. That was heavy. It um, was light. Great job, Ruby. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, she is still my least favorite Canadian. Um, <laughs> I'm noticing this. You're such a hater. God. Am I your least favorite Jamaican too, or like, is it just Canadian? Can I can I rank He's higher on? That's okay. how you know you don't like nice things, Ruby. Don't pay. Right. No That's what I'm saying. You don't like Yanni so <laughs> So Ignis. so listen. <laughs> We got to do this again soon. You all have my number. Um, Topaz Ruby, if you don't have uh, WhatsApp, download it. It's free. Love, um, love you all. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Oh, here we go. Look. Ah, you spoke beautifully, Suzette. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you so much, Lillian. Thank you so much. Epigenetics. You mm -hmm. Epigenetics is deep. Uh, epi the epigenome, again, something that we only yeah. really discovered what in the last 10 yeah, 15 yeah. years That's like brand new yeah yeah yo epigenetics is deep yeah epigenome <laughs> is part of my studies too so uh yeah. learning that learning the fact that if you decide to start smoking now that's going to attach to your epigenome and you're going to pass down that predilection for smoking to your children uh yep. what you choose to do now socially in your choices we're starting to understand it's not in your dna uh -huh. But it's in your epigenome. So, yeah. I mean, those are some social really interesting studies. Mm -hmm. Social determinants are going to dictate the next generations. Mm -hmm. It's going to be heavy. So, here's my thing Craig, if you're going to come in and talk to me and talk to us about it, we will make epigenetics something we talk about next week. Okay. And on that, we've been here too long as it is, y'all. You got to remember, I'm on a different time zone. Oh, I'm like, mm -hmm. you drink some coffee, you'll be fine. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know what? You guys can stay behind the scenes. I'm clicking end broadcast for everybody else. We've given them.